I have an association with a tracking room in uh, Mobile yeah. through the PV Brothers. But um, I actually, my favorite tracking room is Dockside in Lafayette, Louisiana. Hands down, that's where I go to track. Um, if you know, if I'm going to do a big record, and the Mobile Studio understands why, absolutely. Um, they're not; it's not big enough. And uh, but yeah, I love that Dockside. Nice. Well, look, we're not here to talk about the present yet. That comes in several hours. <laughs> we got to go in the past, as we always do. And I want to start back at Farragut Elementary. And when you were best friends with Marcy Janicek in kindergarten. And I only know this from a comment on a YouTube video, so I'm just being a dick. But usually I'm pulling out like the name of a high school band or something. But I thought your best right. friend in kindergarten, how good is that? That is really good. And the fact that you know where I went to kindergarten, you're right. And I did know a girl named Marcy. So now I feel kind of scared. <laughs> no, seriously. You know? She just, she commented that she was very proud of you on one of your interviews wow. on YouTube. Well, that's so awesome. that's all. But anyway, so from kindergarten on, you were growing up in Joliet, right? Home yes. of Blues Brothers. Yeah. So there's that. Well, you know, near enough Chicago, where Chicago to me was, you know, um, almost a, a pheromal city. It was, it was Gotham. It, there were lights and big buildings and trains that went to and fro that I um, would one day get on. And, you know, the excitement of, there was a commuter sense in the old city of Joliet, which was older than Chicago. Um, interesting note, limestone quarried from Joliet is what built the Magnificent Mile. Uh, yeah. in Chicago when you see the, you know, the, uh, the beautiful limestone buildings. So my hometown was very old and I didn't respect it when I lived there. I thought it was, you know, a crappy steel town. Um, but now, you know, with, with hindsight, I realized it was actually quite an interesting, unique city. Right. And so you loved listening to records from a very early age. Were, was there a lot of music in your family or anything like that or just records? Just records. There are no musicians um, in any of my extended family, um, but there's a lot of music lovers, namely my dad, um, uh, listened to albums. We always had albums and my, my older aunts, you know, um, were always listening to music. So one of my very first memories is putting on a headphones, circumoral headphones, circumoral which headphones. for those of you that don't know are any headphones that fully cover your ears. And um, listening to the Jesus Christ Superstar soundtrack, the movie soundtrack, and was so enthralled was I that um, I would get out big pieces of poster board or, or paper, like kid paper, and actually draw out arcs of where I heard different things coming in in the headphones, trying to understand the nature of like, how is this here? And this is here. And what is it? So I would draw these pictures of what, you know, I came to know then as panning. Um, and I lived in those headphones from the minute I think somebody put headphones on my head when I was maybe four. And I, well, I have not come out of them. And so I just, um, I spend my life in a pair of cans. Wow. And I, I listened to that soundtrack quite a bit, which is a little weird because I don't think either of us would say like we're big fans of musicals, but there was something about that soundtrack album. The one in the oh, brown, the brown, like thick cardboard double sleeve. No, no, no. That's no? the Broadway. This is the one. It's the Jesus Christ, you know, the movie soundtrack. Oh, Ted oh, Neely oh. And, and Carl Anderson. Dude, I'll Google the cover. Um, uh, um, what it was, was I grew up Catholic. Um, but of course I'm an ap not even apostate. I'm atheist, but um the hang on i'm gonna whip whip up the uh cover it was ted neely as jesus and carl anderson as judas that i fell in love with um rock and roll love i'm not talking about any other kind either so i was maybe eight or nine so you really you could say even my sexual coming of age um was all tied up and being deeply in love with uh jesus and judas simultaneously <laughs> um nothing wrong with that via that that movie and that soundtrack and um and i am going to produce very quickly here a picture of it you, the, sound, you know, the soundtrack no rush that's right we got five hours i forgot yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh you know google is weird because the one time you only want one thing you get millions of other things here it comes 
that one. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was not the one my parents owned, so it's not the one I listened to. So, yeah, I just, I was, you know, in love with those those two uh, men. Um, still am, very much so. Hell, Ted Neely is still like a screensaver on my phone, and I am 55. <laughs> so something got in me, and it never let go. It's badass. Everything about, I also love, like, Mike Oldfield, Tubular Bells. All of the, but also, you know, Paul Simon, and all of it went through the headphones. It's just one of the earlier memories is Jesus Christ Superstar, where I fixated on where things were. Right. You know, where it was coming out, ah, is over here, and is in this can, and that was fascinating to me. Right. I mean, that's that's pretty early to pick up on something like that. So mm -hmm. with, with this great record collection sitting around, when was the first time you bought a record? What, what was the first record that was like for you, nobody else? First record for me was Tony Orlando and Dawn. Wow. Um, and it would have been the one with... Um, Ty Yellow where, River? Well, no, I'm not sure. It's the one where Tony's in the middle and then Dawn are standing on each side of him. And it was... He don't love you like I love you. All right. He don't love you is what, what, what. Um, and I loved Tony Orlando. And I think I was like six or six, maybe seven. And then directly followed by um, Jackson Five Records. Right. You know, I started buying Rick records as a, hell, I mean, my mom took me to a Tony Orlando and Dawn concert when I was seven. And I got to see the Jackson Five for the Dancing Machine tour when I was nine. So wow. that would have been 1974 at the Mill Run Theater in Chicago. Saw the Jackson Five. No, I was just obsessed with music. But interestingly, even then I knew that I was not the musician, that there was never once in me the dream that I would be the singer, like that if that was gonna be me. It really? was the sound of the music um, and the nature of, of the songs that had me with the exception of being in love with Ted Neely and Carl Anderson, um, I was in love with the songs, but also um, wasn't out like doing little kitty lyrics either. I just, I, I didn't know what I was going to be then, but but it would not be long until I like realized that you know it was going to have to do with songs in a whole different way than being an artist or a writer. Right. Well, because you you were playing, if I've got this right, you were playing flute and tenor drum in school. So like real typical kind of band and marching yeah. band type things. But didn't your music teacher send you home with a bass at one point? He Mr. did. Mr. Don Johnson. Don Johnson. And God, he was magnificent. Um, that was at uh, Dirksen, High, uh, Dirksen Junior High. And he actually saw in me the young Trina Shoemaker marching with the tenor drum and playing uh, flute in the concert band, a bass player. And so he sent me home with a, a bass and a little amp. And he wanted me to play in the high school's jazz quartet. Wow. It was kind of like a funky, you know, modern jazz quartet in the high school band. And um, I took it home and my dad and his friends laughed at me and teased me so much so that I, did, I didn't do it. I refused to do it. And then I've always thought that that was a, a turning point, a huge actual I would be a bass player right now, probably, if I had simply just practiced that bass. Um, so, yeah, I, I didn't become the bass player. Wow. Um, thanks, Dad. And did you, um, I mean, well, but seriously, not. I don't want to get into any shit here, but, like, did you resent that? Did you ever feel like, man, I wish I'd done that? Or it was fine and it's like, oh, I'm not going to do that right now. It wouldn't have been until years later that, and my, you know, my obsession with the bass part and what's the bass player doing and listening to the bass. And it wouldn't have been with... Um, it, at, at that point, no, um, my folks were going through, like had gone through a very ugly divorce. Like in other words, I was a kid that was just trying to hang on to the things to me that were real, that were usually happening in my headphones. And the fact that my dad teased me one night when I whipped out some bass and him and his friends made fun of me and I you know, brought the bass back, that um, disappeared into my psyche and right. didn't really come up until many years later. But by then it, it was fine, you know, that, um, yeah, there wasn't any like, geez, now I never made anything out of myself. And if only I had played the bass. <laughs> it was more in hindsight about why I'm always trying to tell the bass player, unless they're brilliant, what I think they ought to have done. Right. Instead of what they did. You know, I'm not going to change it or anything, but if only you, you had played better, <laughs> cooler. Well, because I've heard you talk about that you're 
you're all about the bass too i mean i am too it's just the best frequency yes. and instrument you know, I was just listening to some, some I don't even know what ZZ Top came, song came on, somebody's little stupid speaker. We were out, I was out with the horses and somebody had their little speaker thingy, you know, playing and ZZ Top came on and I just like froze in my tracks because all I could think is, the bass sounds so fucking great. It's so perfect and musical. And of course, so was the guitar. So was everything about ZZ Top's, ZZ Top's in the, in the 70s and uh Yet still, it was the bass that stopped me. And I just thought, man, that's just sweet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So then how do we get from you're just listening to records at home and kind of figuring out that making records is a thing to you deciding to move to L.A. to be a producer? Well, that happened. You know, of course, I finished high school and then I moved to Chicago um, up into a little studio apartment right when I turned 18 and got a, a job in, the, in a temp pool and was assigned to an advertising agency called Ogilvy and & Mather. And I did a week at Ogilvy & Mather, but the um, manager of the advertising agency, and they were a big, you know, fancy ad agency right there on Michigan Avenue. Uh, he liked me, his name was Tom Collinger. And he um, hired me, you know, full-time immediately to be their receptionist and all that. And, so I hung around there for about eight or nine months. And then I um, put myself on a list for this thing called a drive away, which back then you would be given a car to transport to the West Coast. Yeah. And I don't know what they were doing, giving a 19 year old keys. I to did a, a couple brand. of those. You did, right? Miami so not, to New York. It's yeah, like somebody 17. was like, what are you even talking about? That does. I was like, it existed. I'm not making this up mm. because it fucking happened. Absolutely. And I was good enough, I guess. And so I drove myself to Los Angeles. I did want to. At that point, the idea of becoming a record producer wasn't in my mind. Okay. I looked in my albums and I saw the control rooms and I saw the pictures of the Beatles next to the big, you know, DECA sliding, you know, like gear shifter looking faders and studied every single thing I could. But again, there's no internet then. So it wasn't like I could Google recording studios. The best I could do is look at the pictures that I found in books, go to the library, look up, you know, the art of rec like things about recording when I was a kid. Um, I think I got into a radio station one time with my uncle Ron, I got to see some real equipment, but more importantly, my dad worked for Midwestern Gas Transmission Company, which was on the natural gas pipeline. And the, um, you know, the transmission station was actually underground because if there was an explosion on the pipes, of course, the, you know, the dispatch station was, was below ground. And in the actual dispatcher's room um, was a big board that looked like a light bright and it had all these lights and it showed the whole pipeline that came down from Canada and all these you know, different routes. And it also had big pieces of gear with faders and knobs, like Bakelite knobs, like a Fairchild looking knobs and, and, and meters and gear. And I was so, um, I was safe in, in the, and they called to the control room in the control room with my dad when he was uh, working midnights and he'd get, he'd bring me with him. And I would actually sleep, you know, sometimes under the desks that they had, you know, him and his friends. So being there, you know, around all that gear. So that's in me already, right? Right. So is the music through the headphones. So it's taking apart the stereo and looking around in there and not being able to put it back right. And, <laughs> but also the love for music. So what, am I going to be a photographer like Linda Eastman? No, because uh, probably not. Um, I, want to, I want to be right next to the music, but I'm not a musician. So, and I never saw a woman in a control room picture or a studio picture in any of the thousands that I would have looked at. Pictures of Wilson Pickett in front of a UFO, you know, like all of it. But I knew that I also wasn't going to be anything in Joliet because there was nothing there. There really wasn't anything in Chicago except for clubs, you know. So um, I just, I drove to Los Angeles and then I signed up at the temp pool for Capitol Records because it was round and it had a poke up needle. It wasn't like I had the list of studios. I just went to Los Angeles, took city buses. I knew Capitol was a round building that I would surely recognize. You know, and I, um, I had first gotten a temp job at a Suzu truck of America or somewhere stupid. And um, they weren't stupid, actually. I got to buy it, a, a employee rated vehicle. Nice. Um, and then I got hired at the temp pool at Capitol because I could tighten my ass off. And then uh, that got turned into permanent because people liked me. I was likable, I was friendly, and I worked extremely hard. And I worked my way up to alternative marketing manager over a course of about three years, four years. But 
Downstairs is the Capitol Studios, of course, with a hallway with locked doors. And you didn't just get to go in the studio, but I kept applying to be a runner for the studio or anything for the studio, but they would not hire me under any circumstance and to the point when finally the HR person said, you got to quit hanging out by the studio. Really? Because it's a separate business. And that wasn't being, you know, it wasn't like I was hanging out like a stalker. It was constantly turning in new resume. Like, and now this is me still, they're like, they don't hire women. <laughs> Except as maybe a manager and the manager, like they, they don't need an office manager and they don't hire women assistants. So stop, you know? So I got disgruntled. I had actually gone to A&M as well and asked if I could, you know, try to and um, apply to be a runner there. Because at that point I had, been able to peek in the studios and a few of my friends brought me to a few studios and I wanted to be in them so badly. Um, but A&M said the same thing. They don't hire women in the studio. They said that. Wow. So they're not A&M anymore. They're Hanson, but, um, but I didn't even find that objectionable. I just thought, Oh, okay, well, that's that. So I'd hang out at like my friend, Fred Drake, who ultimately did uh, um, Rancho Del Rio, um, where a lot of like, and he was out there with like the Caius people back when they were Caius and not Queens of the Stone Age, but um, he had like a rehearsal place. So I hung out in rehearsal rooms with like little sound craft boards and I learned some stuff. But, um, well, that was a long way to tell you what I did when I got in LA. Oh, I still that's good. did not work in a studio. Um, and I didn't handle any, and I hadn't handled any equipment really at that point. But you got to, I mean, did you get to go to any sessions with your friends or not really? Just some of Yes, the, yes. Right. No, I did. If I think back and I, and I do think back and I remember, there was a band called Megadeth. I don't know if anybody remembers them, but the lead singer oh, yeah. is this guy named Dave Mustaine and he had this long red hair and he was handsome, but kind of like, like creepy handsome. Um, but he was very, you know, he was, they were very popular at the time, though not as popular as Metallica and that like bothered people at marketing meetings. <laughs> But anyway, so they were coming out with a record called Wake Up Dead. And uh, this guy named Matt Freeman, I think was his name was, I met him somewhere. He was just this little guy. And, uh, but he was always hanging out with Dave Mustaine. And Dave Mustaine would hang out at the tower a lot. Like artists were always in the tower. I saw a lot of artists, but it wasn't like they were gonna stop and talk to me at my desk. They would have no reason to, um, unless they were in an alternative marketing band and Megadeth wasn't. But Dave Mustaine used to come around my desk a lot and say hello. And um, so anyway, Matt's like, yeah, come down to some studio. It actually, I think it might even been Sunset Sound, if right. I really think about it now. Because again, there was a block of time before I came back and, but it also might not have been Sunset Sound. My memories aren't 100% clear, but yeah, I, I, I didn't get to stand around in the, in the room, but I got to like peek into the control room more like, Oh, here, here's a friend. You know, you look in and you know, you see an auto locator, you see a console, there's dudes everywhere. And Megadeth was there working on uh, Wake Up Dead. So, and I got to go down maybe a few times, but I will add, and I know that Dave Mustaine became a sober person and, and openly discussed his own drug problems, but they were doing drugs in those studios. And I mean, not just cocaine, there was heroin and there was scary drugs. And I will say that as a young woman, completely on my own in that world, in the late 80s in Los Angeles, um, I stayed very far away from drugs. Right. I didn't care if other people were doing them. It wasn't like I was going to narc anybody out. I smoked a shit ton of weed, but those drugs were not ever going to be part of my world. And that kind of, it would freak me out because when people got too hammered, then things would, would start to turn into like, oh, there's a chick here. And even if she's flat chested and pimply, she's still not a complete dog. We will try to fuck her. Um, and so it was either easier just to either not be around or to right. leave very early in the game. So I always kept my distance, but I'll tell you what, I did go driving around one night in Dave Mustaine's red Camaro while we listened to sweet emotion. And he was <laughs> high um, listening to uh, he listened to a mix and then, you know, he put on sweet emotion and uh, he didn't hit on me. Um, just like like cruising around near nearby wherever we were. So yeah. Anyway, yeah. Got to drive around with Davis Day, listen to Sweet Emotion. Ding nice. ding 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 ding. Which is a pretty stellar mix, actually. That song. What other song can you name that successfully uses a triangle? There's a little piece from an Ed Grimley cartoon that's pretty good. Um, that's about it. Poke Salad Annie. 
Now, but I would say, I would say that there is triangle on many, many more records than you think because right. every single record Joe Barisi has ever made, he has played triangle on. <laughs> Now I'm going on a quest. And, and it's find true. Every one of them, and I'll make a list and submit it. I don't know if he still does it, but for years and years and years, he would always play triangle somewhere on the record. I'm going to start doing that as well. I'm you should. Put triangle on, even if it's just a ding. Yeah, one exactly. Small you only ding. need the one. You only need the one. Um, I'm, I'm introducing Nicorette Gum into the crunch. Okay. If you guys are wondering. All yeah. right. Good. Yeah. You, you didn't seem as though you were flagging, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So so you're in L.A. You're basically told by all the studios it is not going to happen. And rather than yeah. seek out all the weirder little studios elsewhere, you end up going to London. I end up going to London and I literally quick. sold. Well, I don't want to. I, I just wanted to hit. I mean, I could talk I just, more I, if you want to chew. No, I, it's OK. I'll put it back in. I didn't throw it away. It's too expensive. Right, good, good. I'll save that one. <laughs> um, it's got a, a great sugar coating that I, I put. I like that the best. Um, no, I uh, I sold all my stuff that I owned, which wasn't that much. And I booked a flight to London and I went to London. I didn't know anybody in London. And what made you decide to do that? Just because? Yeah, just because. Because I having moved myself alone in a, in a driveway to Los Angeles and made my way. And then four years later, I'm an alternative marketing manager at Capitol Records. Hell, I had a, a spot, you know, in the main employee lot, not the real far away employee right, lot. I'm right. talking about the one where, you know, the cool people parked. Now it wasn't up close to like Joe Smith or David Berman or any of the many presidents who passed through during my time. Um, but, and I just, I, I had personal reasons why London would have not have been a complete, um, it's not like, oh, I'm gonna just move to Azerbaijan, you know. Um, my mom had lived in England when I was a child. I had gone to England as a child. And I just, I decided that um, I was gonna move to London. Um, I was, there, I guess I should introduce Hugh Harris now because it's relevant, even though he was not at all the reason I moved to London. While I was at Capitol Records, um, they had Capital uh, London had signed Hugh Harris and he was a big deal. Um, they expected him to be quite a big star, enormous amount of money and um, um, publicity going into the setup for his record, which he caught in, in London and it was released and it's called Words for Our Years. Well, of course, that's going to be get a US release and it came through Capital and I was just absolutely in love with his voice and his songs. I mean, I thought it was fantastic. So I listened to it all the time and I knew all the words to every song and anyway I met Hugh very very briefly you know again walking around the tower you know because the tower had outer offices and then an inner area where all the kind of secretaries and you know lower level managers like me got cubicles and whatnot but so he cruises by and you know he uh, his manager Tarquin Gotch who managed XTC and some mm -hmm. other really popular bands during the 80s and early 90s so I knew Tarquin and um and again, you know, I, I, I wasn't a, a big player, but I, I was gregarious and outgoing and sometimes audacious. So, you know, sometimes my name, people remembered me when I, I'm not really sure what made them remember me. So, and that's not self-deprecating. I just don't fucking know. I'm not that cute. You know what I mean? It wasn't like I had to drop dead gorgeous chick. I just must have done or said something that um, attracted attention. So anyway, they split and you know, whatever that record comes out, it's great. So perhaps just like London just seemed like a place where a lot of cool music was happening. I thought that, you know, maybe perhaps, here's the truth. I was depressed. I couldn't get into any studios in Los Angeles. I felt, you know, 24, I was getting old, that I was missing my chance, that I didn't want to be a music industry secretary, that there was more in me. I didn't know what that name was. Um, yeah, I wanted to be a fucking engineer. I wanted to be the person punching in and out in the cool studio with the headphones, like I wanted that. I wanted to touch the equipment, but it, it started to feel completely like um, impossible. So I just sold my shit and I moved to London into a cold water flat in Earl's Court where I lived with several Australian people um, who were very nice. And, uh, and then I um, got a job, tend and bar, um, pouring beer at this place called the Portobello Gold in London on the Portobello Road. And as I was bar mating one night, 
um, no longer depressed because I was too shocked to be depressed because I found, you know, my little run-ins with depression, which have been few and far between, but when they came, they were significant. Shocking yourself into a survival mode worked for me. You know, here I am, I have to survive. I can't lay around the cold water flat and refuse to get out of bed because I'm too depressed because I'll starve. So, um, you know, I got, got my, my ass moving and, and Tarquin Gotch showed up at the Portobello Gold. And he said with a British accent, which I won't do, wow, aren't you the girl from Capitol Records? And I said, yeah, aren't you Tarquin, the manager, you know, Hughes manager? And yeah, how odd to find you here. Hmm, it is odd, isn't it? I quit my job. Now I live uh, nearby and I'm working here. And, uh, and he went on to say that he was leaving for Chicago to um, produce the music for a movie, Home Alone, which obviously got very famous. Yeah, it did all and right. his office, his office manager was on maternity leave and she would be gone four to six months. Maybe she had some other thing going on. And he wondered, he remembered me being very, you know, you know um, well-liked and obviously a, a you know, person who knew how the music business worked. And would I run his office for six months while he went to Chicago. And I was like, oh, I don't want to be a music industry secretary. He said, yeah, but you could live in my flat which is upstairs in my <laughs> swanky ass, you know, London building that had, you know, several floors and, and hot water, you know, hot water. You'd live in my, my top story flat, the fourth floor, then the, the management office is on the third floor. And then there's a, a rental flat on the second floor, which was actually partially the first floor and then a basement flat, which wasn't buried. You know what I mean? How they're like, kind of like, yeah, you, you get that. So and, yeah. split level. And, um, and I will pay you, you know, what would amount to $2,000, you know, dollars. Well, remember, you know, this is 1990. So $2,000, and it might even been closer to 3000 over the course of the period would was significant money for me at that time. It was a windfall. It was massive. And so, and, and for, you know, board and, um, and free housing. So anyway, I agreed. And, and I started, you know, just a few weeks later and um, I showed up and I moved, you know, my, suitcase because I didn't have anything up into his flat and I got myself established in the office. He had his, his accountant and uh, and his accountant's wife, Graham, the Grams or Graham, not sure of the last names, were nearby and they were always in and out. So it wasn't like I was left completely, you know, on my own. And, and I and I basically was Tarquin's assistant. And um, and then one day Tarquin failed to mention to me that Hugh Harris actually lived in the downstairs <laughs> flat in the basement flat and had a little studio set up down there and was demoing for his next record with all of his buddies. Um, Sam Hurley, who was a brilliant guitar player, uh, was there and, and then other like Jamaican-y looking dudes uh, coming in and out of the basement. And I'd like stayed up in that office until finally Hugh learned that I was upstairs and he came running up those damn stairs, bounded into the office and, oh, you know, the American girl, I love. So I stayed away from them <clears throat> until one day I decided that, again, I don't think I'm not attractive. I think the filter I got on for you people makes me more attractive. However, <laughs> I was in, you know, I was thin, I was uh, acne ridden. I was not there to, I never thought that my looks were my way into anything that had never been um, bolstered in my entire life. But I was smart and I was brave and I was bold. So I went down one day, I really like geared myself up for it. And I knocked on the door and I asked if they would consider allowing me to sit in so I could learn to record because I wanted to be an engineer and nobody would help me anywhere in the whole world. And look, there weren't recording schools then. There yeah. wasn't anything. You learned by going into a studio and being hired and that was it. There were no colleges. There was no, there was no pro tools. There was no fucking internet. So, I mean, there was internet, but there was no World Wide web. Um, this was a very real world, which we, you, you lived in. And so are we losing people that are viewing or, Is this getting boring? No, not at Keep all. Keep going. Okay. So anyway, knock, knock, knock. Hi, Hugh. Um, can I, can I come in here? I want to learn to record, you know, and I just said it and I was near tears, you know, ready for him to either do something really rude and scary that would, you know, of course, make me run back upstairs and, and feel awful, but he didn't. He said, yes, yeah, sure. Come on in love. And look, they made it all of them in there clear to me that if I 
was looking for sex, any single one of them would have hooked me up right then <laughs> if that's what I wanted at any time. But when I made it very clear it wasn't, they never pestered me about it. They had gorgeous women in and out of there, beautiful girls, sexy girls um, that were, you know, like that did want that very much. And, um, and I just didn't, you know, it's not that I never wanted to get laid. I just. It's not it, what you were there for. It was not what I was there for. And, and it mattered to me so much that somebody believed me for the, for in my life about this thing um, that, you know, I, I certainly, um, I couldn't, I mean, then I was suddenly, you know, near this little Tascam board, but it was still a board. It had faders and a little Tascam remote control for a 16 track one inch and early digital performer on this like old, you know, DOS looking mainframe. And, and within 20 minutes, he was like, all right, love, I'll try to do the accent. I just, right, I so said, I'm going to, okay, he said, play and do a call. So you see, he showed me how to like punch. He says, so I'm going to sing, and once I breathe, like I sing, and I breathe, you punch after I breathe. So you don't punch my breath, right? So don't punch my breath. So wait till I breathe, and then punch it on the next line at the top of the consonant. I was like, all right, you know? So I started punching for them guys, right? They just needed somebody, you know, because they're trying to play, you know, and the spliffs rolling, and they're sloppy, and they're laughing with that stuff, but they realized early on, we told her what to do she doesn't move. She runs our little tape machine for us and she's good at it, right? So then, you know, a few days later, he'd be like, come on down, we're gonna have a session, you know, and then I'd be get my books out because I had some library books, you know, about recording and the fundamentals of, you know, analogous recording. And, and I was worried about volume and he's like, no, love, it's all volume. The meter's volume, the, the fader's volume, the knob is volume, the bass knob is volume. It's all volume, you just run volume. And um, shit like that, you know? And so for several months, I was in and out of there, you know, doing even going so far as to cut in a few little edits, which was rare that, you know, they weren't really set up for heavy editing, but just watching them figuring out themselves, figuring out digital performer, which was hilarious. And I never even went near that. But um, then Hugh uh, was brought on tour with Sinead O'Connor, who's nothing compared to you. That was the record that was out and she was, massive yeah and so Hugh getting that tour was huge and you know the band rolled out for that tour Tarquin ended up coming back my time at the there was done and um so I got a backpack and I filled it up with stuff and I went to Amsterdam and then I hitchhiked from Amsterdam to Istanbul wow. for the next six months because I was sad because I still thought well there's your recording career <laughs> good luck <laughs> Wow. Well, they had become my world. And yeah, so yeah. Um, even, you know, we'll see you back in LA sometime or whatever, you know, none of that mattered. I felt like I had gotten close and it felt so good. And I was in the seat and I was with really, really talented people who treated me with decency and kindness and said things like, oh, you know, you've got a good feel for the low end love, you know, and they'd say things like, you got a nice ass to go with it, whatever. Like I loved sexual banter. I was you know, I still am very much a, a, a wellspring, <laughs> but um, I was sad and I didn't want to go back to LA. And, and there was no thought of going around London studios and trying to. Well, no, because the reality of London was after I had arrived there and had been at that cold water flat for what, a month working as a bartender, I realized you did something very impulsive in order to save yourself from spiraling into some kind of like depression or whatever and then Tarquin Gotch just happened like so quickly and out of the blue that it, it, it sent me into this trajectory that then to face my real reality which was what I have like 2,000 pounds or whatever it was right. and I can't stay in Tarquin's flat anymore Tarquin wasn't the guy that's like oh you've done so well let's set you up at Abbey Road right. it was kind of like they, he, for one thing, he went on tour with Hugh, which in other words, it, the, the, they were, it seemed like the office in, in a way almost was closing down. I think he might've even been opening a branch in Chicago. It was just my time was done the day that the, the buses arrived and the band left and I stayed for maybe a week or two. And, and then I, I wouldn't have had the money to afford to live anywhere in right. um, London and, I, and it was cold. And I, uh, I had met this Australian girl who was no... Um, 
not in the business at all. It was just that I, I maybe even met her at a pub, whatever. And she actually had a backpack. She's like, oh yeah, mate, we're going, you know, hey, we're, you know, I can't do Australian at all. We're, we're, you know, me and some friends are, you know, going to Amsterdam and we're hitchhiking to forever, you know, Brussels or at some place in Europe. And I was like, oh, backpack. And then I knew that that existed, this backpacker circuit. And it never had occurred to me that that's my next step. But in fact, it did at that moment. And I got a backpack and I filled it up and I decided to join this little group of Australians who seemed perfectly nice, people my age, who it was all very safe then it felt. And mm. um, yeah, and I, I just, I, I went with them. <laughs> I can't believe I did this shit, Andrew. Seriously, I did though. And uh, and then we parted ways, she and I, in you know, somewhere like Istanbul or Ankara, somewhere in Turkey. But I, I, you know, picked up with a different small set of people until they wanted to go to India. And I didn't want to go to India. I wanted to go to Israel. And right. You know, and so and for six months I did that. Um, and that was life changing because that was more survival. Um, and then I ended up back in Los Angeles broke. And then, do I just keep going? Yes, absolutely. This is amazing. Fuck, man. I'm okay, so share in case the cat wants to come up. So you know, I, keep, 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 keep. So I, I do that. You know, I, um, I ended up in actually at that point I was in Israel, staying with these people who a lot of people let um, backpackers in their house. You know, they would go to hostels and. And there was never any, I'm sure there was crime associated with with this behavior, but I was never a part of that. Because once again, I didn't do drugs. I didn't seek out drugs. I had no interest in, in finding sexual encounters with, you know, the odd Polish man who like wandered by, even if he was attractive. I was terrified that my backpack would get stolen or that I'd be killed and raped and left in Albania in the mountains. And so you were very, very careful. Um, I never hitchhiked alone. I never, you know, two women together, there were rules about, we would never ever have gotten into a car that had more than one male, really more than one person, unless it was at least one other woman or a child, you know, so there were rules that you learned nonetheless in Israel and Iraq invaded Kuwait, right? Right. So you are on the television, it is basically all US citizens that are in Israel, by Israel have been asked to leave immediately, not you know, might want to mosey out. You are, you, if, if your passport was shown when you entered this country, you better report to Ben Gurion. We want you out. Um, so I did, I went to Ben Gurion and got pulled out of the line and interrogated for almost two hours, maybe five hours, because I had come into Israel through Haifa off of a merchant marine ship from Turkey because you could book passage on the deck of a merchant marine ship for 30 bucks across the mediterranean wow this was like you know a raft like people are doing now this was a merchant marine ship and there are a bunch of travelers backpackers on the deck and but i came in through haifa but i had spent like a month in turkey just backpacking around hostel to hostel staying wherever you know because i was with a group of uh, the australian girl might have still been around for a while but anyway whatever but they thought that that was really suspicious. What were you doing in Turkey for a month? You know, why'd you come in through Haifa? Until it finally came down to me saying, look, if you think that I got a bomb in my pussy, you need to look right now. I'd really appreciate it. If you would, I will spread my legs. You can dig your hand around in there. I don't give a fuck about your religion or your country or anybody's. I want to go home. I'm done. And they let me go. So wow. I, flew back, I flew back to London, then to LA. No, I didn't. That's bullshit. It's I flew bullshit, to London. Trina. I flew to London <laughs> and then I flew to Bangkok. Fuck and I yeah, spent you flew to another Bangkok. Another several months in Thailand. And after that, I was broke. Then I flew back to Los Angeles. And guess who was there? Tarquin. Yes, and Hugh Harris. And there you go. And guess who Hugh Harris was producing his record with? Who? Susan Rogers. Uh huh. A woman producer. A woman. So I get back to LA and I didn't know she existed. It just, I didn't, I didn't have lists of producers. Um, there was no internet. So I hook up with Hugh again and uh, Hugh wants to know if I can like score him some weed or something. I'm like, yeah, I can hook you up some weed. And so anyways, I come down to the studio. Susan's, you know, producing my record. And again, I didn't go, oh, a woman. I really didn't. It occurred to me that she was a woman, but at that point there were no women. So it was never... There wasn't an armada of women all ganging together to say, why aren't there more women? It was just like, wow, that's weird. Cool. Right. There's 
but she had worked with Prince. So nobody questioned whether or not she was a woman. It didn't matter, she worked with Prince. She recorded fucking like Purple Rain or whatever, you know, and so Peggy Leonard that I would, you know, also come to learn that there were this like small amount of women out there. But anyway, I went in, this was at Sunset Sound, yeah. you know, and I was just, you know, gawking at Susan and pestering her and staring at her and breathing on her. And, <laughs> and she finally looked at me and she said, oh, you want to be an engineer? You need to leave this town. It will never happen for you here. You will never make a name for yourself. The only reason I'm in this chair is I was a Studer tech right. for Studer. Like yeah. I worked for Studer. Yeah. I was like, I don't work for Studer. I don't know shit about the technical part. I just know about the knobs and what, how they respond to me when they don't respond to other people. It won't work for one person. I touch the knob, the knob works fine. So anyway, she said I needed to leave and that she couldn't help me. Nobody was going to help me go find somewhere I could make a name for myself. Some small town that had some kind of music scene, not London, not New York, not Chicago. And so I picked New Orleans. Right. And so I just moved to New Orleans. So you didn't know anyone there? You, that nope. just. Nope. Isn't that weird? You're, you're very yeah. good at that. It's a, that is the well, there is the there's the mystery of my life it could have been i've thought about it i've thought what was the real though something new orleans didn't just appear in my midwestern mind but what did appear in my midwestern mind were like not just southern rock it wasn't even that it was more like i was cold growing up all the time so I'd done Los Angeles and that was warm, but that wasn't for me. And then, you know, maybe I had, oh, well, Streetcar Named Desire. Right. You know, the early, you know, the things that had taken place, those kind of things, you know, in as they did all of humanity were so sultry and alluring that they were in my mind. Um, then the idea of like humidity and warmth. And one thing I did know is Yellow Moon, Dan Lanois, that, the, yeah. other, the Neville Brothers record that had come out. And I think I had heard pieces of that in London, Yeah, but I had no idea that it, who Dan Lanois was, you know, none of that. I just, you know, I, I can almost remember hearing the refrains from, you know, Aaron Neville singing Yellow Moon in London. Therefore, you know, if we line up the dates, I'm sure it was, you came out about that time, but there was no association. I didn't know who those guys were there. It was more about being warm and being somewhere and I, I just, I went to New Orleans. So I can't remember the other uh, well, stimulus that brought me there. Let me, let me ask you a question then. So you don't know um, necessarily who Dan is at that point, but had you been studying records and feeling like, man, this person has produced so many records that I like? I mean, were you, were you starting to build up a little catalog of any of that stuff? Only, no, I mean, yes and no, but not for the current records, not for what was out in the world now. It was more like, okay, well, George Martin, we all know that. Um, it, it would have been more like whoever had produced Rolling Stones, Glenn Johns, you right. know, the, um, the, the, you know the, um, the, the Johns brothers. And now I'm going to lose all names. No, it doesn't all matter. But yeah, but you so know, like all the classic dudes. 70s. Yes, yeah. I was only listening. I was still only listening in my heart to 70s records. Those are the ones that were embedded. If you look at my list, you can see that. Um, so modern producers, I mean, of course I knew about Brendan O'Brien and um, the guys who were doing like all the Jane's Addiction and, uh, but I don't remember their names, um, Lanois and that world, but I didn't know their names because I was attached to the songs. And at that point I was so, oh no, I, I forgot something important. And, and this is, would be a disservice to anybody from uh, that wonderful place that um, is listening now, which I doubt is anybody, but when I got back to LA after going through Europe and um, you know and and through the Middle East or you know the Eastern Euro Europe and Thailand and whatnot, uh, I went back to LA and I did sign up for this small recording school called LA Recording Workshop, yeah. which at that time had several programs, but I think I did the four month program because that's all I could afford. Um, and I learned how to line up tape machines. You know, I learned the basic. I, this is a dynamics processor and this is a effects processor and this is a patch cable and I learned this very very basic understanding of um being in a studio I called my dad and got the money for that um it was very very short though and in hindsight really didn't prepare me at all 
because I'd already been looking in studios and like in and out, walking in, sat uncomfortably on the couch, which is uncomfortable for anybody who's not on the session. Yeah, I was that person. So I'd leave right away. It's like, this is, I don't belong here. I only want to be in here if I'm Susan Rogers. You know, if I'm like in that chair. Right. So um, when I went to Los Angeles, or to New Orleans, I did have that little backbone with me, right? So once I got there, um, no, I didn't know who was producing what, none of that. I knew I had my little knowledge base of like the studio and the gear in it. Um, not who made records, but what ma- records got made with right. was where my mind was. Um, Cause I didn't really care who called themselves the producer. Now I understand why, um, but we'll talk about that in the present. All right. um, so uh, I went on the city bus. I started saying first night hummingbird hotel, believe it or fucking not. Then I moved out of that and I thought I'll blow my whole, you know, 800 bucks I have. And I stayed at like some little shitty hotel in the French quarter for, I booked it for a week. And then I went on city bus. I looked at the phone book to all of the studios in New Orleans. Cause then I had my like certificate of technical prowess in the studio or whatever they called it. And, uh, and I, I applied at all of them to be a runner and none of them hired me except for one ultrasonic as the maid. And they said, we're being hired you as a clean maid, not a runner. Just know that there's a difference here. But we don't have a runner, so you can do that too. So <laughs> that's nice. I got, but I, I was overjoyed. Two hundred bucks a week, and I was going to get to clean in a studio, and I could also hang out after the cleaning was, you know, and and be the runner when the band or, or crew wanted me there. So that was it. I was in. Right. I was in. I was in the house. And it was David and, Farrell um, who ran that. Yes. It, well, well, he didn't run it. A, a guy named. Um, I think his name was Jay Gallagher. I'm not positive, but I think he was Jay. It was Jay. I don't remember his last name. I think it was Gallagher. He was the manager. I don't really know who owned that studio. It might've been Jay, but David was the engineer. Right. Um, uh, the house engineer back when, I mean, that was, who, you know, it was his room. Um, but I don't think he owned the gear. Anyway, David, from that moment that I showed up to clean um, and said, I, I really want to be an engineer, but I know I'm the maid. I, I know who I am. Um, he was kind and, and, uh, and, and outgoing and and super just gracious and and uh showed me the magic and showed like taught me immediately and welcomed me and it was absolutely wonderful and i love him to this day to this minute i love david farrell because without him doing that he could have been a dick and that yeah. would really probably hurt um in a way that you know who knows maybe i wouldn't have recovered from but instead he's like he lets me get near the patch bay and I'm so scared of the patch bay, you know, it's this big old MCI board and it's this big patch bay and, you know, letting me figure out the patch bay and Ham and Scott was around from Rounder Records at the time and they were always cutting records there, but real cool people were coming in and out. They weren't rock stars like Los Angeles. There wasn't like hair bands or nothing, none of that. But it was like Gatemouth Brown and Johnny Adams and Irma Thomas, these incredibly talented people. And this setup that was much more probably like Stax Records or those records of, of lore where everything's already set up. Right. And then the musicians kind of slot them in themselves into the sound of the room. And that was kind of more David's vibe. So when I cleaned, I cleaned around microphones that may never have been moved in five years before I, you know, I don't know. So the setup was kind of um, often static. The sounds were the crafting of the sounds was paramount to everything. And, um, I cleaned there and, and I never did a session there. I was always the maid, but I learned more from David as the assistant. They eventually would call me the assistant, although they had an assistant that wasn't impressed that I was being called right. an assistant. And then one day I was cleaning and Malcolm Byrne from King. Now I'd heard of Kingsway at this point, but it was a completely closed environment owned by a rock star producer with a Canadian crew Nobody's even sure he always moves his location, you know, because because again, Oh Mercy was cut in one house. Yellow Moon was cut in a different house. He's on the move. Um, then there's the creepier rumors like they're into like, you know, s and or like baby eating or like goofy, <laughs> you know, the rumors that come with like Q people. Who, yes, like they could be anything. They're Canadians. <laughs> we don't know what they do. Well, they're not from down here. What they aren't is Americans. And more importantly, not- more, firstly, they're not New Orleanians. Secondly, 
they're not Southern people. Thirdly, they're not Americans. Fourthly, they're Canadians. Can I can I just say how much I love the irony in the American seat of voodoo, thinking that Canadians, the nicest stroke, <laughs> possibly most boring people in the world, were more interesting than them yes yes and that is it's i mean as far as like the studio little and no offense and, and, no offense to the canadians or right, you know. none at all because you know where would we be without canada nowhere no we wouldn't even be a continent the u.s needs a hat yes <laughs> look at this my hat so anyway so malcolm shows up and sees me cleaning out there and you know right away says to the guys and like you know who's dead and you know, she's Trina, she cleans and whatever, she's cool, she's nice. So Malcolm decides, because uh, they had the very early mastering some digital software because the owner, they were all on the cutting edge of the nascent Pro Tools and all that. And Malcolm was cutting Chris Whitley's record though, Living With The Law over at, at, at Kingsway. And he needed something done with a, with a DAT. You know, they had, I don't know what it was, I don't know what he needed done, but he had to leave it there for Jay to do whatever process, new digital process he'd wanted done to it. And, um, and he said, make sure the girl brings it to the studio. I want her to deliver it later, right? <laughs> you know, so it was all goofy. I walk in the control room and like the dudes that were in there, I don't even remember who was working. They're like, oh yeah, you know, all the raunchy. And I was like, <laughs> all right, I will deliver it. I mean, if that's, if you were telling me that you're asking me as runner maid and now young assistant that I'm required to deliver this, I will. But why are you doing that? Like, are you sending me I, I guess sending me to like to get raped or something weird. <laughs> like, no, no, Canadian, you know, but, but, uh, no, because I really didn't. I, I was like, but well, why are you though? Like doing that? Because now you're making me think that you're sending me into like a dangerous place. Are you sending me to a dangerous place? They're like, no, but you know, we just assume that I was like, you're assuming that I'm going to go over there and, and they're going to fuck me or I'm going to fuck them. Cause you just did like this. So what I'd like to just know is like, <laughs> am I going to fuck them? Or are they going to fuck me? Cause if they're going to fuck me, then I'm not going to go because that could mean that these are scary drug druggy like freaked out people and i get trapped in a you know um, a, in a mansion and like remember um that mickey rourke movie that was real dark and weird um that all uh, the one about harry angel that he was like the devil and robert de niro was in it what the hell? angel heart okay oh, I think right. that had just Good come God. out so i was like Ugh. maybe the Anne Rice books were out now already. Right. I don't know. But I was like, I don't want to go down there if, if it's true that these people are into like weird shit. So anyway, they made a joke out of it. And I went down there and I brought the dad in, knock on the side door, it creaks open, you know, and this dude standing there who looks like a, like a, like a homo erectus or something. He's like <laughs> long hair and heavy browed and hello. You know, I'm like, I hear a drop off a dad for Malcolm you know, and I hand it to him and he's like, come in, they're up front. That guy's name ended up being Wayne. He was real nice, Canadian. Um, <laughs> so I march in and I'm like walking in 15 foot ceilings, the whole thing. I'm in this grand New Orleans mansion in the French Quarter. And what do I hear echoing through the halls is Chris Whitley, you know, like living with the law or it might've been big sky country or some magnificent, because that record's badass for you people out there living with the law. Chris sadly passed away, but record is a game changer. And I hear that and I come up to the front following Wayne and they're all up there like Prince of Darkness, long flowy shirts and dark jeans and long stringy hair. And, you know, and I'm, I look more like, you know, studio assistant girl who doesn't look anything n not noticeable. And, uh, but they had tannoy golds in these Lockwood cabinets, which at that time I didn't know those were Lockwood cabinets with tannoy golds, but they're stacked too high and it's blasting. And it sounded so good that I very nearly burst into tears. And the clearest thought I had is I will work here in this room on music like that. And I will do anything short of sexual behavior that I will not participate in uh, by my choosing, um, but I'll be their slave. I'll work for free. I will do whatever they want, but I'm working here. And remember, I had no entitlement. It wasn't like, well, I've gone to my school and I've got my degree and I, yeah. I wanted to eat. I wanted to be near the gear. I never thought, and you'll be a huge producer at that point, all I wanted to do was be near the equipment, 
hear the music come through it, be left alone and make something out of myself that I could be proud of, which would mean you're not a drug addict or uh, made forever. Do you know what I mean? My bar yeah. was low. It was to survive, not end up molested, murdered, demeaned, abused, hungry, um, in an accident where I didn't have insurance. You know what I mean? Like I just wanted to live. So yeah, if I, my job was to pick up condoms, I used a pool cue. If I needed, if somebody just had to grab my ass when they walked by, so the fuck what? I don't care. It wasn't like they then pinned me up against the wall because then I would have fought because I grew up tough. I grew up fighting. And if somebody was coming after me, I was going after them. Yeah, I would probably get my arm broken or punched in the face, but they would get hurt too. And then we would call the police and then there would be a, you know, there, was, there wasn't any, I didn't tell anybody until 10 years later. Right. Fuck them up or you're going to get killed, but I'm certainly not going to let them. But I didn't care if people grabbed my ass or said, you got nice titties. Cool. I do. I would have been hurt if I'd have stood in there and not one guy made any comment about me being slightly good looking or at least good looking enough to have sex with if I wanted to. I would have been crushed. Like I would have thought I was the ugliest chick on the planet because there wasn't anybody else in that room for 10 hours. So they might as well look at me. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Isn't that true? Is that wrong? No, no, it's, I, you know, of course. And in return, I got to put out sexual banter that made me feel good to any sexy dude that I wanted to without the repercussions of seeming like I was coming on to them or that I had expectations that I was going to be with them, which I clearly wasn't, therefore humiliated by some handsome, reasonably well-known rock god it at you know like like some young guy who was just fucking gorgeous i could openly flirt with him and he would flirt back but there was no expectation that i was gonna be his new girlfriend right and on top of that that was just like a sexual outlet because we're sexual people i certainly am meanwhile i'm learning the trade dan was brutal to work for so was melvin well, so, so was hold on. so so you go in that first night and say oh, yeah, i'm right, gonna right, work right. there but yeah so how did it actually happen well, Malcolm tried to fuck me that night, of course. So but I said, no, um, I went back to my cleaning job. And then Mark Howard, a few days later, rolled up on one of his motorcycles. And um, he asked me to come back down to the studio uh, for a session he had coming up because he needed an assistant. And I said, OK. And then Jay, the, you know, the owner of uh, Ultrasonic, I wasn't scheduled. So, yeah, I just I went back down there and um, and very quickly it came to mark's attention that i actually had learned and was good at locking using a lynx timeline remember those oh god yeah well they weren't so dan dan wanted um whatever the session was or malcolm session i don't even remember what the artist was chris whitley's record was finished um to lock two studers and um through a timeline and even at the first day or so because mark I don't know why he, I hung out for a long time that night, by the way, when I dropped off the dad, that wasn't like an immediate, here's your tape. And, and it, it, Malcolm was nice, you know, he was kind of weird and Chris was lovely, but they were really busy. They were mixing and working. So really for whatever reason, Malcolm was fine with me being there, of course, later, because he would have been like, Hey, you know, you want to have sex, but he also accepted my no without, you know, a big deal. Um, you know, so I, I, uh, I guess I, I left an impression on Mark and Malcolm and, and you know, they probably thought it was, I don't know, maybe Chris liked me, whatever the deal was, Mark showed up, come back down. I did. Um, he started teaching me stuff about the room. He worked me hard that night, but a, a day or two later, he wanted me to come back. And then Dan was there that day. Right. But he's like, don't you talk to Dan. Don't look at Dan you know, just do what I asked you to do. This is, you, talk, you know, I already know how to solder. My dad taught me how to solder. My dad did electrical work. You know, in other words, he was a builder when I was growing up mm -hmm. in, and anywhere, in other words, he was a furniture builder and a part-time electrician worked for, you know, gas dispatch. He was a dude that did all that stuff. So I already knew how to solder, God damn it. Anyway, uh, so they had me soldering and making cables and stuff, fixing cables mostly. Um, but he said, don't talk to Dan. Uh, cause this was like a Dan session and Dan didn't, 
know or want me around. Um, and, uh, but then the machine, like Mark could not get the machines locked and Dan was freaking out about it. And I made the mistake of saying to Mark loud enough for Dan to hear, Dan knew I was in the room. I just wasn't supposed to speak to right. him, right? That was acknowledged in advance and I accepted that. Um, and I, I was watching Mark make the same mistake over and over and over again. And I said, you're making a mistake when you load the second machine. You had to, had to load the first machine and then yeah. do the thing and then load the second machine. And I said, you're, you're, I don't remember what it was. You're making a mistake. And you know, Mark glared at me and Dan's like, well, then you go lock the goddamn machine, whatever it was. And I did, I walked over there and I locked it immediately. Mark was angry at it at first until he wasn't because then Dan was just like, you stay by that machine you keep those things in lock for the rest of this record. So suddenly I was meant to just, I guess, move into the next to the tape machine. So um, I had to you know, leave my cleaning job and agree with Karen Grady, the studio manager, who's still my best friend. She was lurking around the back. So I, you know, come up front. I'm like, um, blah, blah, Dan wants me here. I'm, I'm going to have to get paid though. Cause I just, if I'm going to stay here, whatever, you know, and they agreed to pay me whatever it was 12, $10 an hour or less, $40 a day is what it ended up being. Right. Um, but I was allowed to sleep there if I wanted in an empty bedroom or on the couch, wherever there wasn't an artist because it was residential. And I could eat whatever food the band didn't eat or whatever that was left over in the fridge. So that was like room and board in a way. And that was it. I pretty much, I didn't leave that studio again for years. Do you remember what record that was with Dan? You know what, in fact... Chris Whitley's record had just, do you know what I think it, it, it could very well have even been. And now that I think, I think it is Dan's very own record, Akadi. Oh, really? The first one? His solo record. Yeah. If it wasn't that, I don't think it was Brothers Keeper though, because that was later. I'm pretty sure he was doing work, but I can't be sure. Dan did a lot of soundtrack work. He could have been, yeah, yeah. it wasn't like the Robbie Robertson record. It wasn't it wasn't a big record, and so I'm not sure what it was, but it had Dan back in town at Kingsway working on something that, you know, he would be there for for a week or two or even just a week. And I stayed for that. Why can't I? If you gave me a minute, I could actually remember exactly what record. Well, I'm not we'll sure say right it's Akadi because that's cool. And I it like might as record. well have been because they were doing it then. And it also there was also stuff going on. Malcolm was still working on Chris Whitley, sort of. He might have go back and like fix a mix or print another. You know, in other words, all these records were kind of happening around the same time. And I was the, I became the tape op. And then I became the tape editor. And right. then that was my job as I was the cutter for everybody's records. And so, I mean, obviously you'd had a lot of experience punching in and this was something you had a good affinity for being a tape I had an affinity for it. My experience, no, not enough. Because even at Ultrasonic, I didn't get to punch a bunch. Right. But what about the editing? I mean, when did that happen? The editing learned, and I, I will go back to Ultrasonic for that. David Farrell said that when there was no session going on, I was welcome to put up junk reels, empty reels, you know, whatever I wanted to. I could transfer them like a Rolling Stone song over to the machine and then practice editing right on so it wasn't on like tracks that were outtakes of 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 um songs that you know were, were being yeah, yeah were but currently just, but yeah. like i could put on the half track my favorite songs and do new edits on them so then in that way i start to learn to understand the nuance of tape and the buttery forgiveness of it you know but also how hard it is to cut half track right because you can't go back. So then I start to work on the ones that have like multi-track and cut on the multi-track, but just cut on the snare and just make sure you can clear the drums. And if the drums are clear, you can punch the bass and the guitar. Like you can punch the stuff that won't make the edit. So you got to honor what will cross the edit, but try to honor as many things that'll cross the edit. And all of that, you know, David would tell me offhand, but truthfully, once I taught myself on the half inch, figuring it out and then watching other people edit endlessly for hours, made me go up, but the jink, 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 and finding the transient and the focus it takes and the trust and the steadfastness with your hands, that was all me. I had a nature for punching and cutting tape, and I don't know where it came from. Right. Amazing. So, all right, so you are now full-time at Kingsway. 
tape hopping, punching in, and you're working on some pretty cool stuff. I mean, it seems like a lot of Malcolm's records, but maybe yes. that's so. And so one of them, the the Lisa Germano record, is so yeah. fucking good. It also has one of my favorite yeah. credits ever, where drums by Drum Machine. <laughs> yes. Which is brilliant. But that's also um, the same year as an Iggy Pop record. <gasps> yes. So American Caesar. I would love to hear about both of those records, please. And I would love to tell you about both. I do have to confess, the old lady that I am, I need to pee. Can I do it? Literally, my, my, okay. Go. Eight to 12 seconds. <laughs> it'll be, it'll be more than that. I would imagine. This is so good. But this is where I'm just really uncomfortable and I'm going to sit here. Um, there was talk about what is under the quilt. So here, I can fill you guys in. The quilt is on a ladder because the cats, as you may remember from previous episodes, like to climb up and down onto that beam and then they go up into the attic. And I got sick of them jumping, scrambling up and then jumping down onto the modular synth. So I put a ladder there with a quilt on it and they've actually started using it. So I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, yeah, so that's what that is. It's cat furniture, which is pretty exciting. Um, yeah, I'm playing with a little piece of plastic here. That's what I'm doing with my hands. I'm going to put that down because I don't really need to do that. I also have a, I've got a toothpick in case I need a toothpick. I have two phones, one landline, one cell phone in case anyone needs to reach me. But I wouldn't answer either of them because I'm in the middle. Ah, lovely you got back just in time i had just shown everybody my toothpick and explained the ladder with the quilt on it oh, excellent so before we lose anybody let's hear about some fucking iggy pop iggy pop well jim osterberg um as he is actually known when you speak to him um as you know like a guy instead of as iggy pop which was one of the first things i was like okay he's not iggy that's a persona and he's jim osterberg was beautiful brilliant like vastly wise and intelligent i mean it, it, he was a guru i mean he walked in at that time and i don't know if he was married to her if it was his partner but he had a um uh his wife or partner this beautiful japanese girl and i'm afraid i don't remember her name but she was wafting around which just made things even cooler because i think she might have had on a kimono or some shit it was like whoa and um, Iggy took his food very seriously. He was always, he had a very beautiful meal for himself every night. He um, was amazing to be around. Um, you know, Henry Rollins came in for overdubs on that record, which was crazy. And Iggy was just bold and fearless and talented. And, and he said funny shit that was just, you, you, you died laughing. But Iggy started to trust me early on that I, lorded over his tapes because he was very afraid of tapes being stolen. I don't know if that had happened to him. I'm assuming it had, but he made sure that I, you know, archived every roll every night, locked them in the tape safes, which we normally never did. And, you know, he was there to watch me take them out in the morning. Um, Malcolm worked me hard on that. Iggy had said very clearly he wanted no work going on unless he was in that room, period. Yet Malcolm would leave me, make me work all weekend, well into the night, doing edits for him and, you know, whatever he, a list of things to do. Because tape was always rolling in the Iggy session, jamming, writing as they worked. There was no, let's start cutting songs. I, you know, there were probably 60 or 70 rolls of tape from that record or more. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'd be like, go dig out that jam we did last week, you know, and, but then one night I was doing some edits in the headphone um, for Malcolm and Iggy came in there and he just tapped on my shoulder and I you know, stopped the machine and took the headphones off and he yelled so hard at me. I started crying and I was like, Malcolm made me, you know, wanted, told me to do this. And he said, Malcolm is not your boss. I am your fucking boss. You listen to me or you go home. Wow. You know, and at that time, of course, I was devastated by that. But then not long after, because the studio was supposed to be shut down. Iggy wanted a day off. That's what it was. Malcolm had me working on the day off. So Malcolm, at some point, Mosey's near the room and Iggy goes after him. Nothing like he went after me. You son of a bitch. 
I told you, blah, blah, blah. You got her working in here. She never leaves this room. She needs a break too. And then he's like, I'll stand it up for me. Malcolm's glaring at me. I was like, I didn't do nothing, guys. I just, <laughs> so then that passes, right? But not, that was towards the end of the session. And then Iggy came up towards the end of the session and handed me a check for $2,000 from Jim Osterberg to me as a tip. Fucking hell. Taking care of it. Yep. Changed my life. That's you, when I thought. Did you photocopy you could, that thing before you cashed it? No, Damn. I didn't. I, sh I didn't, you know, I, I had no wherewithal to, of the documentary, and I, I was not, but, but it did make me understand that I could be recognized for what I did if I did good work by anybody, you know, like, in other words, it wasn't always just going to be Malcolm or Dan or Mark that were going to say mean things and make me feel stupid. Sometimes somebody would do something that made me feel all based on just the, the, the quality of my work and the, and the grit and uh, steadfastness that I showed. Um, and you know what, I didn't cry when Iggy yelled at me. I nearly did, but I apologized and told him it wouldn't happen again, but I might have to leave because Malcolm will fire me now for sure, or whatever, you know. Right. So, but of course that never happened. Iggy was brilliant. Wow. Caesar will rest now. <laughs> then he's had that great song, I'm So Fucking Alone, on that record. That was good. Yeah, he's he's just the epitome of being a badass. Yeah. No I mean, question. he talked about heroin back when he's like, when I got busted, you know, like, back in the day, you went to prison for a joint. You know, you people don't know. Sh I think that's actually one of his rants on the record. There are a lot of ranting, a lot of ranting, a lot of, lot of uh, early rapping. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, Amazing. That's, my, so, that's it. So was there fallout with Malcolm from that or it just was a passing thing and done? No, because the minute that, you know, Iggy went after him and then Malcolm realized, I'm sure that there would have been fallout later if Malcolm... Malcolm was brilliant. And again, Malcolm shared his brilliance with me. He let me see the magic. He shared the magic, magic, but it wasn't going to come without a cost. So Malcolm kowtowed at that point to Iggy. What was he going to do? It, it, it's Iggy's record. Nothing. I'm sure he paid me back later, maybe a few days later by maybe getting drunk and then yelling at me really bad about something completely unrelated. Right. Um, but in that moment, there was nothing to be said except Iggy told me to put the goddamn tape back in its box, lock it back up in the cabinet, give him the keys and leave because it was my day off. Right. You know, so there wasn't anything Malcolm could have done, um, but he'd have paid me back somehow. Right. Uh, I mean, Malcolm threw a dat machine at my head once, not during that record, but for another record because it came out of record. And uh, while he threw the dat machine, he was screaming fucking Japanese because I think it happened to be a Sony dat machine. It was all this, like there was so much emotion Right. And a lot of it was not properly, uh, whatever, channeled. channeled. Yeah. And, but, you know, again, I didn't care if you threw a dat machine at me. It didn't hit me. If it had hit me, that would have been different. And furthermore, if I really wanted to pay Malcolm back, I could have punched him in the face. He would have <laughs> fired me. Do you know what I mean? It was like I was an equal yeah. to them and I was equally as aggressive. So, but I didn't throw the dat machine because I couldn't pay... Dan once smashed a Martin 12 string on an EV wedge while he screamed at me, when I tell you to turn the fucker up, turn the fucker up. And all I thought was, I'd almost rather you hit me with the guitar because then the guitar might have been salvaged and I could go pawn it <laughs> if you don't want it. If it obviously <laughs> means nothing to you enough to smash, you could have hit me and giving me the guitar and then I could get some money. So all of that kind of crazy, emotional, violent-ish behavior, I guess it would have sent a lot of people packing. Dan did eventually send me packing with inappropriate behavior, but it wasn't because he smashed his own Martin stupidly on his own wedge. No. Well, before we get there though, let's let's hear about the, the Lisa Germano record though. Too, love you, Dan. Lisa Germano is a singular talent. I love yeah. her records. Lisa came in, you know, a, a Malcolm production. Malcolm was really on top of his game then. Um, and he still is, but he, was, he had the, like the popular stamp of popularity, a producer popularity. And um, 
Lisa, I think she had either just left John Mellencamp's band or would very soon leave John Mellencamp's band. Um, she had gotten signed, you know, with, with, as, as her own artist. And she was very uh, beautiful, petite, delicate. Um, she was very out, uh, outspoken in a way, but she also drank a lot. And so there was always that to deal with in the studio. She was brilliant and she kind of mumbled a lot when she sang, but it was gorgeous. It's way before there was such a thing as a whisper chick which is now, you know, a commodity right. that you could actually buy stock in. <laughs> she was the first whisper chick that I'd ever heard. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There, there weren't whisper chicks before that. I, I can't name a single whisper chick that existed before Lisa Germano. Can you? No. So this was about 92, right? Yeah, it would have been. You know, so there weren't any. There's not any. Anyway, the point is there weren't that I could name. And so she had that real, you know, self-indulgent, inconsiderate bitch. You know, and she, she said it was such like jolly authenticity that she yeah. didn't need to sing it loud. And her voice was very chimey and bell-like. And she was a damn good, I mean, she was a like a wildly uh, talented musician in terms of like schooling. Like she knew, she was classically trained. And she had a beautiful bottom. And um, she liked me. I mean, we got along really well. It was very turbulent between her and Malcolm during that record. Um, and there were a lot of, um, there was a lot of alcohol abuse by all people in the studio during that record with the exception of me. So I have altered images of it. Right. Like during Iggy's record, Iggy doesn't drink or smoke, period. He's sober. So, yeah. and he certainly didn't appreciate it if Malcolm was drinking, which he, Malcolm did very rarely on that record, but Lisa's record, everybody was, it was, everybody was hammered most of the time. They got great stuff, but for me, it was made me insecure. Right. Well, so there's another record that same year, which I'm very curious about, the Fripp Sylvian record. <gasps> yes, David Fripp and Robert, Robert Sylvian, Fripp. right? Yeah. Robert Fripp and Dave, <laughs> yeah. sorry, sorry guys. I um, yeah, well, that thing came through and I was, um, I was, rel you know, not relegated, I won't say that, but I was pushed into, see, remember, I was still considered the assistant during even Lisa's record, during the Iggy record, because the engineer was Mark, or the engineer was Malcolm, but on records where Malcolm ended up going onto the floor and playing, which he did on Lisa's record, on a lot of records, the auto locator literally just got shoved my way. So I was meant to drive. So that's why I got good at punching. I learned like trial by fire very early on when they're like, you know how to punch? Yeah. Okay. Oh shit. You know, <laughs> but even those early Hugh Harris wait, you know, and, and, and you have to wait for this moment. And you also have to understand that there's a gap between when you think go and you press go and it goes and you have to understand they're different on different machines. And, but just that, you know, hair, that, that very quick response, I guess I could have been a good like shooter or whatever, I, um, marksman, um, mm -hmm. you know, that that was there for me. Um, but yeah, he would push me the auto locator. And so then I, I'm, I'm driving, but also somebody would yell from the room, hey, you know, let's get a fatter tone on that guitar. Well, there's nobody else in there. So yeah, I would just go over to the API and mess with the EQ and then somebody would yell. I said, get a goddamn bigger tone, you know? So then I would take 500 and shove it all the way to 12. <laughs> oh yeah, that's dope, man. That sounds fucking cool. Oh shit, you know? And so I was just bold because they wanted a change facilitated and not a little, oh, how about one eighth of a DB? Right. We weren't mixing, we were trying to get tones and everybody's wearing headphones because it's an open studio yeah. set up. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just shove all the lower mids way past, you know, six and then, um, of course that by definition shuts off all the high end. You don't even have to dump the high end. And so, you know, that's an exaggeration. I didn't always do that, but um, I got yelled at a lot. And then when you're getting yelled at, you need to either deliver or you're about to be fired. Yeah. And luckily each time that it got really ugly and people were screaming and guitars were getting smashed. And uh, I managed to deliver something that saved me from being fired. Right. All right, so Fripp, anyway, come on, Fripp. Fripp. Well, those guys Fripp. rolled in, and so they had a whole like um, British cadre of like they came with their own thing, and I think they even brought an assistant. And so I was really a tea girl, 
And, um, and it was important that Robert Fripp has his, have his tea very specifically his way, which meant warm the cup up first. Right. And he taught me how to make the tea for him. And um, I, I was very, and I was really just not a part of that record at all. So I, um, I, I stayed in the kitchen. I would bring in coffee service. I would stick very near to the back because I'm quite sure they had their own assistant engineer and engineer or milk, whatever the deal was. Right. I, I was not at the council. I certainly wasn't driving. Or if I was, it was minor. Um, and, you know, the thing is like uh, uh, King, uh, who's that band there? Fam- he's famous. Well, King from Crimson, King- yeah. King Crimson. I didn't really know who the fuck that was. I mean, I knew, but I, that wasn't part of my wheelhouse. Right. Fair enough. I mean, it just, you know, what else did they do that was super cool? Was who? that cool enough? King Crimson, I guess, was big enough because I yeah. didn't. I didn't listen to King Crimson. King to me, Crimson, that was like they were pretty. They were pretty big. But well, at the moment, yeah. though, I would bet you most people on the planet would say that the best thing Fripp's ever done are his lockdown videos with Toya Wilcox. Have you seen any but, of these? No, see, and I don't even know what that is. Well, so okay, so Fripp, he still lives in the English countryside, and he married a singer named Toya Wilcox back from. They've been married for a really long time. But they started doing uh, Sunday lunch videos, and they do covers. Now, he's known as a very buttoned-down, no sense of humor. Yeah. Right? But these videos are insane. So it's him, like, the, early on, it was him playing King Crimson riffs and Toya just dancing in the kitchen. But now <laughs> it's turned into covers. They did a cover of an Alice Cooper song this week. They've done uh, Iron Man. Like, they're crazy. Totally I'll go check. Up. I'll go check him out. They and I'm not fun. dis. I'm not dissing Crim- King Crimson. I'm just no, no. In my little just limited wheelhouse, I was more like I knew who Kraftwerk was, but perhaps not. You know, because yeah, the yeah. people around. Yeah, I hadn't discovered that yet, and there so are, there are a lot of records being made. You know, it's yeah, yeah. So all right. So forget about the Fripp thing. So let's move on to 1994. Because in 1994, a little band called Pearl Jam shows up at Kingsway. And this is with Brendan, right? Yeah, Brendan O'Brien was producing and Nick Dedia was engineering. And so why? Because nobody in that entire list is from New Orleans. Was this just they wanted to go work at Kingsway or what was the deal with that? They were on tour. Oh, right. Okay. And they had, I think, three sold out shows at the New Orleans Lakefront Arena. And they had heard of um, uh, Kingsway, you know, because enough, you know, kind of like R.E.M. had either just been there or would just. In other words, it it had like a little thing going on at that time. And um, so they decided to book the entire week uh, while they were, you know, having their shows anyway and book out the studio from like a Saturday to the through the next Sunday and do some tracking while they um, were coming through on the road anyway. Right. And so, <laughs> well, you know, th- this is, this is not something that I, um, uh, have to keep secret cause nobody gives a fuck. When I was 17, um, I actually for a short period of time dated Eddie Vedder. His name was Eddie Severson at the time. He lived uh, near Chicago. I lived near Chicago. We were kids. We were 17. We dated um, and then he left and he think he went to San Diego or Florida or somewhere with his mom. And I um, uh, stayed in Chicago for a little bit and then I also left the city. And uh, it just so turns out that many, many years later, 10 to be exact, I think I was 17 um, when Pearl Jam came in, uh, he rolled in and I had no idea who it was. I didn't recognize him and um, didn't remember him. He wasn't a musician when I knew him for one thing. And, uh, but he wasn't a band. He was playing bass in a cover band in Bolingbrook, Illinois. And that's where I met Eddie Vedder right <laughs> the fuck on. And he was cute, you know? And, uh, so they, and he started following me around. So for the whole first day and a half, he kept following me around and asking me weird questions about Joliet, my town I grew up in. And then he finally said, look, you and I need to talk. And uh, he took me to a room and I, I thought that I was going to get fired for doing something offensive that I didn't know what it was that I did because he wasn't hitting on me. It wasn't like I shot down some kind of sexual advance. And then he finally said, you don't remember who I am. It's Eddie. It's Eddie from Skokie. Eddie's, you know, Eddie Severson. And I finally remembered and it was embarrassing and he was thrilled. 
because somebody didn't remember him. So he marched down the stairs. I'm like, please don't tell Brendan, please don't tell Nick. <laughs> They'll think that I'm a groupie star fucker. And that somehow I only ended up here because he's like, well, how could they think that you already work here and have for a few years, like playing the I'm long like, game. Still, still, they're going to think badly of me. If you tell them that I'm your old girlfriend, he's like, I looked for you for a year after you left Chicago. Why didn't <laughs> I went to your house? I talked to your dad. I was like, oh, fuck. Wow. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, he's dude. the creepy one. Well, I mean, he was, I left <laughs> town. Kidding. And uh, yeah, when he came back, I think he expected me to be there and I wasn't in. He said he looked for me for a little bit. It was very sweet. Anyway, and at that point, he's about to get married to um, his fiance, who I have no idea who that was, some chick. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just awkward. And Brendan did look at me like, oh, yeah, of course you are his ex-girlfriend. And I was like, you know, I'm actually not. We dated for like really short period of time. And but no, Eddie left notes for me all over the studio in my like notebooks over by the tape machines and how proud he was of me and how I love music more than anybody. And he insisted on taking me out to dinner one night. And I went to the shitty restaurant. And of course the bill comes and guess who doesn't have any cash on him? <laughs> the rock star. And I was like, oh, I gotta pay for our dinner because you don't have any money, but you're a millionaire, but that's cool. I'll pay for it because this always happens to me. And he was upset at that point in his life. He was so young and he was so lovely and talented and all of that. But Kurt Cobain had just shot himself. And I think Eddie felt like he had to compete with like imbalanced drug addicts that shoot themselves in the head and leave their children orphaned. Not something to be proud of. You don't have to be suffering to be great. Right. No, but, but was there, mixed, was, it, there was some weird backlash against Pearl Jam because they seemed to be relatively yeah. normal people. Yeah, and, and, and for whatever reason, Eddie was in the throat. I mean, literally, Kurt Cobain, I think, had just killed himself several months before or whatever it is. And so he was in a lot of pain. I think he was trying. And look, Eddie grew, had some very difficult things in his childhood. I know what they are. I certainly won't cite them now because that's not my... Those were private things he told me as a teenager. But, um, you know, he wasn't a man who didn't suffer, but he was a man who was strong yeah. with a with a with an incredibly strong character. So, no, you're not a drug addict who shot himself. You know, you're just as talented. Maybe you're not. I don't know, because I wasn't really following your music. That's why I didn't even know you were in like a band. <laughs> um, I'd never even I heard Jeremy. Sorry. You know, and um, anyway, so. I did point out to him that he needed to quit bitching about being rich. If he wanted, if he didn't want to be rich, then give your money to like an orphanage in, in Romania. They need cash. He's like, I'll give it to you. I was like, I don't want your money. I want to be an engineer. Um, and you need to address, you need to accept what has happened to you and make good with it or go kill yourself because listening to you complain about how hard it is to be under all this pressure. I respect that it. it's incredibly hard yet you're not giving yourself any obvious solutions. Give your money away. Make your whole next record dedicated to um, girls' education in Uganda. I mean, I don't know, do something. Meanwhile, pay for the dinner, pay me back. You know, so then like the next day he put a thousand dollars on the console, which I threw in his face. <laughs> dinner was 1895. I don't want your money. I want you to understand that with your money, you can make the world a better place. I can't do shit. I get 40 bucks a day, okay? I ate a sandwich out of the trash that Stone Gossard left wrapped and was perfect. So that's me, Eddie. Anyway, it was I very love, cool. I love that because it's it, this interaction can only happen because you had dated when you were 17 but didn't recognize him. Like it's, exactly. It's this here, moment. look, I will, show, I will prove it to your listeners here. If y'all can see, and I only have this handy on my phone because I brought it up earlier. Yeah. That yeah. is, in fact, an inverter, and that's Trina Shoemaker. We're in Joliet, Illinois, near an apartment building. So, look at those arms. He was a little hottie. Yeah. He was like little, you know, little cute boy. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. There it is. And was that a perm, yeah. or were you were you curly haired back then? I do have curly hair. Um, there was a little. Uh, I, I'm sure I may have curled it, sprayed it, permed it, done, done right, awful things right. to it. I have terrible hair. So anyway, that well, was that style. That was like. Your webcam has gone into a uh, Barbara Streisand mode now, too. It's like, I want to, I'm going more Diane Cannon, old right. Diane Cannon. Nice. It's really, what I kind of had in mind. <laughs> Look, I'll get you there, people. There we are. There you Thank go. You. <laughs>
So look, so, but I want to hear a little bit, just a little bit, if you want, about Brendan and Nick. Well, I had a crush on Nick because he was just beautiful, sexy pirate, long, dark hair. And did you know about him before he came in? No. No. So not only did I find him attractive, he was super, 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 both of them were, they were exactly what you think. They were at the top of their game. They were powerful producer engineer team. Um, Brendan O'Brien was a badass and also a great guitar player, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And he had like the lingo with the band, the history with the band. Um, I remember when Eddie had to leave and he came back and he said, no, things just sound dark to me. And cause I think Eddie flew out for a day and came back. Brendan's like, you just fly. Yeah, man, I'll ask your ears, like, your, like, whatever. He just knew even, like, don't listen to Eddie because Eddie just flew. And so right. I'm not changing my EQ until your ears decompress or whatever. And Nick just ran a tight, you know, he, there were technical problems always at Kingsway because it was an installation in an old mansion done by hand by a bunch of different people. So when there were problems, Nick was always real patient, waiting for me to get them sorted out, which I always did. And um, they were just pro and smooth other than Eddie and the, you know, this is my old girlfriend, embarrassing <laughs> walk of shame down the front stairs when he's practically crying because somebody doesn't remember him, who he liked. Um, uh, once they kind of stopped acting slightly weird about that, because uh, then Eddie's like, well, I want, I'm only going to sing if she's here. Oh my God. Oh, God. oh my God. I want you to wear my coat. No, your coat <laughs> smells like B.O. Please don't make me wear your coat. Um, anyway, it's kind of weird um yeah they were they were they were respectful and they were talented but what they really were were so far out of my league i thought that all i wanted to do was not make any mistakes that would call attention to myself whatsoever right one night the band showed up after getting like after a show that's what it was because i was actually staying at the studio because i was requested to stay at the studio 24 hours so i could guard the shit right because they had guitars and stuff there and they didn't trust just locks so I actually was sleeping in a little on a couch off the, this little room off the uh, main tracking room, and uh, they, the band came back and they, everybody was drunk and they wanted to jam, right? And they're like, "Put up a roll, put up a roll." I was like, I "Absolutely cannot put up a roll of tape. I cannot, I cannot engage the control room without Nick Dedia or Brendan O'Brien's express permission." You have to remember, they are my bosses, not you. You guys are the band. I get that, but I can't touch Nick's setup. I cannot put up a roll of tape and run multi. I will run a DAT. I will go so far as to put the machine in input and I will run a DAT of exactly what comes out of this console, but I cannot touch a single fader. And if you continue to pester me to do that, I will actually have to power down the room and you won't get any, you won't even get a run DAT because you're asking me to do something that will get me fired. Period, full stop. I will be fired. And if you can't respect that, then I'm sorry, you could be mad. Stone was the one who seemed so angry. How dare I? Like, we're Pearl Jam, we're asking you to record us right now. And right. You're saying no. But it was deference to Nick Dedia and Brendan O'Brien. Like, I wouldn't dare have touched their setup. So, anyway. So you rolled it. You know, Pearl Jam never called to have me record. So maybe I did piss him off that night. <laughs> <laughs> And well, I never saw, look, and I never saw them again. I never saw Eddie Vedder again. I don't think Eddie Vedder has any idea who I am now. You know, I, his, he would obviously remember my name because it was too quirky, but we have no association whatsoever and never have since that 10 year anniversary where I, he rolled into Kingsway and surprised the shit out of me. You're going to make their next record, I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But so you know what? His daughter was born, I think, even on this, I think um, his daughter, the first one he had, uh, and my son were born the same year and I think even the same day. Wow. So we went off and had our children, you know, many years later, um, you know, simultaneously. So that was kind of hip. Right. So about this time, were you thinking about moving up or you were just head down? working your ass off i was head down working my ass off but i realized okay look mostly what happens is sessions bring their own engineers they bring engineers who have made made names for themselves and are hired by the bands and they come in and 
you know, the studio is just booked. Very rarely is the house engineer used as the actual engineer, unless it's a Dan, you know, Malcolm or Mark thing in this situation for me. And since those guys are gone a lot and a lot of other records are starting to come through here, I'm essentially locked into being the second engineer, period. And the only way that I can end that is if I go, if I leave, you know, at, at some point start taking outside gigs that aren't Kingsway gigs, right. Kingsway assistant gigs and uh, start making a name for myself. So I, you know, I knew that I had to build my own career separate from Kingsway if I was ever going to be an, a, a real engineer. Well, because because in 95, it seems as though that starts happening. But I want to ask you about a Dan record first. And then there are two other records I wanted to ask you about. So first, the really obvious one is Wrecking Ball. Because yeah. that is a seminal record in a lot of people's minds. And strangely for me, that wasn't a record that clicked the way it did for so many other people. Because I was a huge Lanois fan anyway. And that wasn't one of them that was like made my head explode. But for a lot of people, it absolutely did. It did. I'm just checking my audio here real quick. You check. I really think I, I think I should stop, do a save and go again and go back in. Okay, let's do it. You know, just... Just since I looked at it, you know how you kind of look at yeah. something and you're like, I've jinxed it. Yeah, well, see, that's why I don't even, I record using this thing called audio bin recorder, which is like the dumbest wave recorder ever because it uh, never, it doesn't know how to crash. Oh, well, Pro Tools, my Pro Tools knows, oh, Pro Tools exactly knows how, how to fuck to crash. Yeah. All right, we're good. We're back in. Let me make sure. Yes, we're recording again. All right, so okay. Wrecking Ball. Wrecking Ball. I've just professed my ignorance at not thinking it's the best record ever made in the history of the world, but I would love to hear a little bit about that record. Well, I'm adjusting my camera a little bit. How nice. am I? You look great. Remember, I can't see it. I really, it's a blurred box. Okay, cool. Um, hello. Um, so Wrecking Ball got started up in Nashville uh, at, I can't remember, Woodlawn, I think. Um, and so Dan came down with the record and it was already several songs were already cut. I know that um, there was uh, Goodbye was already cut. Um, I think they had six or seven tracks. He came down with it and he wanted to finish it at Kingsway. And they rolled in as Dan Sessions did. Uh, everything is mic'd, everything is set up. The entire studio is a giant orgasmic recording you know if there's two b3s they're both set up and mic'd if there's in other words everything was it was just congested and very 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 dense with instruments and microphones and um we started recording there were some really high moments there was where will i be was recorded and i can still i will never forget that yamaha kid red yamaha kid in the drum room we called it with brian blade starting out with that beat that second line beat ish um, and this, how good the kick drum sounded in the control room, right? Malcolm turned up the fader and just one of those moments you're like, now that is kick drum sound. Drum sounded amazing. Dan came in with his electric mandolin and, you know, they're trying to cut that song and Emmy's voice is coming through on a C37A through a API 312 and a 560 EQ and a 1176. And PCM 70 long haul modified 22 milliseconds was the pre delay. Oh, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that was the vocal chain. And uh, just I, again, you know, I was deferential to Dan, of course, he's the producer, and then to Malcolm because he's an engineer, and Mark, and he's an engineer, and me, and I'm an engineer too at that point. And so, you know, there was a lot of music going on, there was a lot of Dan's behavior going on, uh, Dan it was, was uh, had some animosity towards me at that point because I think I had gone away to do a National Gallery record, which is a German band. Um, and I had left the premises and booked myself separately than his assistant um, as, a, as an independent engineer and I cut a record. And I think somebody else wanted me to do it again and it conflicted with a scheduled thing, not the Emmy record. And it got, Dan got wind of it. Karen, I think, was trying to protect me. Karen Brady, the manager, who was brilliant and mm -hmm. remains brilliant. Um, but she wasn't able to hide that from him somehow. And he was furious about it, that I had, you know, thought that I would be going independent anytime soon. And uh, he was going to make me suffer for that during the Emmy record. And he did. 
really made me suffer until the point where I quit and walked out on that record. Wow. Indeed. Walked out. It was awful. I was in tears. Malcolm was screaming. Neil Young was supposed to come in the next day. Uh, Mark was out of town, right? So, and it was my setup. It wasn't Mark's setup. I'm the one who did the setup for the Emmy Lou. Mark Howard is who I'm referring to. Yeah. Um, and uh, Malcolm didn't know the recording setup because it was different every time we set it up. There was no set thing. And uh, anyway, Dan called me a name and it got really ugly. And so then I just quit. And I was like, I'm fucking done. Fuck you. I'm not going to do this anymore. Obviously, I don't have what it takes. I don't have what it takes to be an engineer because at this moment, you're not going to speak to me like that. You're not going to call me that. Because I'm done, I quit. Because you just called me that. And I'm not gonna say what he called me, it was rude. But I'd had enough and I literally walked out and uh, got home, you know, sobbing, my career's over. But I was already thinking, fine. I always wanted to be either a geologist or an archeologist. I could still use my hyper-focus, my ability just to dig on something for, you know, 45 minutes. And I'm gonna have to go to school and I'm gonna have to reinvent myself. I'm not yet 30 years old. And I will just, I'm done. I can't do it. And Dan just screamed, he'll ruin my career. You know, he will. Um, and uh, Malcolm called and, you know, he's like, get your fucking ass back down here. What the hell is the matter with you? Dan calls everybody names. Like, what's the big deal? He's been calling you names since he met you. Why does it matter this time? And I can't explain why I did, but I had reached a, a point. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then Emmy called and she said, uh, she asked me, please come back. This is my record. I'm hiring you as my recording assistant to come back and finish my record. Dan's an asshole. He shouldn't have done that. We need you here and we want you here. And, um, and then I did, I, I decided to go back and I went wow. back that night and I told Dan, Dan met me in the office, fucking livid, but I was livid too. And that's what I mean. I can be tough when it's time for me to be tough. I hold my ground um to the death and i told him i quit kingsway i no longer under your employee you pay me for these hours and you other than the producer who can speak to me only to tell me to do specific roles that have only to do with this record otherwise we don't speak we are not friends if you slam one door upon entering or exiting in my presence meant to upset me i will leave and i won't come back these are the rules of engagement are we gonna do this? And he's, you know, agreed. And um, and then it was as if it never happened. Dan acted like it never happened. He was gratuitous. He wasn't overly. He wasn't like a we like 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 a suck boy. He just treated me like a respectful employee. I did my job. I did exactly what he told me to do. I uh, excelled, and uh, there was no more name calling. But when that record ended. I, w I left the studio, I was done. Right. Like I wasn't like, okay, well, I'll just be your engineer again. I took it seriously and was ready to have no, have my career be over. But I, was, I finished Emmy's record for Emmy. Right, that's amazing she called, Love that's you, awesome. Man. It was because it was a really serious thing that I did in this little microcosm of life and it was gonna cost me my career. Right. And, uh, and, it, and, it, and it may have, but it didn't. But I, um, you know, I just, I, I was just done with it. I was just done with rich, people being mean to me poor and working so hard i was just i was done with it and it was well, at that point you know that yeah, i was like i don't fuck I, you guys and i don't want to I, I, you know i'm i don't want to make it into something it ne wasn't necessarily but in your mind at that moment the fact that you truly believed that you couldn't possibly have a career independent of what had just happened Right. Like that was going to be, that's it. You were done. You could not make records anywhere in the world because of what had just happened. And that's kind of, that's kind of nuts. But well, I can I absolutely guess, see it. You know, you can see it insofar as, yeah, I, I, I guess I imagined I could go to some, you know, tiny studio. And what I, what I actually, it wasn't that I didn't think I could get a job anywhere. It's that when a person who is as powerful as Dan Lanois was at that time, he was, yeah, and he was tells king. you, I will ruin you. What that said to me is, I won't be able to, I won't have any reference. Like in other words, I can never mention Dan. I can never mention Kingsway. 
So where am I going to go? I mean, people, I could say, yeah, I worked at Kingsway Studio. Well, well, what, you know, why'd you leave there? You know, what was it? A falling out with Dan Lanois? What if Dan then knew that person already? It's a very small world. You yeah. know how small it is. Yeah, At that point, yeah. it was much smaller, way smaller than it is now. Everybody knew each other, certainly producers. So if I showed up somewhere else and they, and I, or I told him I, you know, I, I quit on Dan because he called me a name and I got sick of being called names and I, I just, at that point, I felt so defeated. It was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Cause what you have to understand, I didn't know that outside of Dan's world that other places didn't also treat you like that. I right. just assumed this is how records get made. You get yelled at, you get um, paid low, you get humiliated, you get told you're stupid, you get um, your fingers snapped into, you know, paper, you know, clasps to get your attention. You have pencils thrown at you. You're not allowed to look at the artist. You're not allowed to speak to the artist. You diminish people's creativity by percentages that are laid out to you. I just felt like I making records is for people who are stronger than I am. I had no idea that that kind of, I guess it's abuse, whatever, actually um, didn't really happen everywhere. Right. Happened other places. But, you know, I just thought this was how it was. Wow. And mostly I could hang. And mostly right. I, I thought most of it was funny until I didn't that yeah. day. Yeah. And I wanted to punch him in the fucking face. And the fact is I could have whooped his ass right there on the floor <laughs> in front of I'm not messing around. I'm a tough person, but I'm not a violent person. What I really wanted to do is punch him in the fucking teeth. Right. Knock him in the, like, like break his jaw. But I couldn't do that. So the only thing I could do is quit. Right. Well, and I love Dan. Dan showed me the best secrets of all. He gave me what I wanted, which was the magical secrets. And he made me pay for them. And that's fair. It's a good trait. And so without being specific what what do you consider the magical secrets what what are those things that get the bass right and he showed me how to do that and he showed me how to be bold with sound and how sound how malleable and nuanced it is and how if you this is going to sound stupid but if you in your heart want the sound to give you something that you can already hear, it will. You, you have to be able to translate what you feel and hear in your head into reality. And you do that with these, this boldness of frequency and this boldness of this intuitive, unexpected, like where, if it can't be that, what can it be? What right. other thing, what does it really need right now though? Not let's add some more guitars and we'll see if we can really get this chorus to punch. What does that chorus really need to give it one thing so that the listener falls in? The verse ends and the listener is, is, is transported into the chorus. What can cause that? Like what are the, what can affect that change? And to make you think that way so that now you know, I realized it's not what happens in the chorus as much as, and Dan didn't teach me this. He opened my mind to teach myself things about what is right. going to make the chorus happen. For me, it's rarely the chorus, it's the transition right before the chorus. Right. If you set that transition up just right and beautifully and maximize it, the chorus can actually be nothing changed. The chorus just opens back up to what it was two measures ago in the verse. A great example of that is um, Van Morrison, and it stole me to my soul, that song, um, and it stole me. He sets up his chorus with this like a, a, a pre-chorus, bridge, whatever you want to call it, that just creates this tension. And then the chorus happens and you feel like this big thing happened, but it didn't. It's just exactly like it was before, yet it seems brand new. And it's because of the way they set the transition up before the chorus, even if it comes down to the two beats, before the chorus downbeat. Right. What are you gonna do with those so that when the chorus, so the listener's all like, ah, uh, and then ah, uh, or ah, uh, in the chorus and you didn't have to add 45 guitars and you know, a cymbal. You just set it up right. Dan taught me those nuances. Are you getting bored? You yawn. No, are you? you I did not at? yawn. I did not, <laughs> fuck no, I did the opposite of yawning, whatever that is. <laughs> Uh, no, I think it, that's genius because it, it's like it's something I deal with a lot with younger bands where 
they've written the verse, they've written the chorus, and sort of the end of the verse, you're kind of waiting for it to end so you can get to the chorus. Right. And it's, but I've you're, never thought about it in that particular, I mean, it's the same thing, but never really thinking about it in that way. So See, and Dan didn't teach me that per se. He taught me other things that allowed me to see that as a young engineer, right. that level of musical prowess. And I'm not a musician, so remember, I'm not going to play the build, you know, uh, and, uh. so I have to be able to envision it and, and then often create it out of what other people now, because I mix so much, have given me and they haven't seen it either. So now I got to maximize that transition. How am I going to do that? Right. Um, but those that 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 ability to 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 actually viscerally envision and internally hear the song way before it's mixed, Dan showed me by allowing me to really sit right next to him when these things pass through his body. I mean, he, he might have made me braid his hair while I sat next to him and played the <laughs> guitar, but like whatever. And he wanted like vetiver oil with so much sandalwood mixed into the same thing and like then do some braids. But yet I'm still right behind him yeah. while he's playing that guitar and he's recording himself and I'm feeling it and I'm watching it. And then he is telling me stuff along the way. Um you know, and, and sharing with me. So he right. shared the most important parts of himself and then other parts he just was mean and weird and confusing. Right. Which we can skip over unless you don't exactly. want to. But no, I, I, so, because I feel nothing but um, grateful to him <laughs> for sharing, yeah. you know. So look, let's talk about another record, which is nothing like Wrecking Ball, but it's of particular interest to me. You worked on a Sun 60 record. <sighs> Joan Jones, I, David Russo... I mean, it's all there, but like, I can't. It doesn't even matter. It's only because yeah. that was their third record. And I worked on their very first record with Greg Penny <sighs> and just always loved them. And I'm sure I, I, I it's drawing a blood. I mean, I remember the name, but I can't remember okay. what the music. All right. Well, like. look, forget it. Let's go to another record because this is also as Sorry, far as I can 16. tell. No, no. Um, so Giant Sand and one of the tracks, oh, yeah. Happenstance, yeah. Happenstance is on your playlist. And holy yes. shit, does it sound good? That yeah. talk about exploding in the chorus. Yes. Fucking hell. But that is also of sort of now were you independent when you did that record? Is that when you went off to do or what was the deal with that one? Well, we would have to just that could, see, even though I went independent, by the way, on that day with, with Emmy Lou, um, it's important to note that within a month and a half. Well, Malcolm's still like, okay, I get it. You left Kingsway. Well, do I just get to hire you independent to be my engineer when I bring my records to Kingsway? Yes, you do, Malcolm, but I'm not employed by Dan anymore. So I'm going to have a rate that you're going to have to pay. You know, so he continued to hire me just to come right back to Kingsway. Um, so I just don't, I may have already been independent and I may have still been under Dan's employ. I don't remember. I'd have to right. look at the year but it wouldn't have mattered that the end game was the same. I was working for Malcolm. Right. Yeah. That was a crazy, amazing record. That's the first record I ever did backing vocals on. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. You have quite a few backing vocal credits. I fill in when nobody else will do it. And it's easiest for me just to go ahead and do it because, but I generally don't prefer my voice. I have great pitch. I have almost perfect pitch, but I don't, I like the sound of my voice. It actually makes me, uh, puts me in a bad mood. Um, and now that they're my productions, unless it's really special and I really want to do it or I, or I decide to do it, I'd rather somebody else just do it because it's a lot of work. Right. Right. So, but you, I mean, you've got, an, you engineered and I believe mixed that record, right? Yeah. Uh, I did a lot on Giant Sand. I did engineering. I did some singing. I did some mixing. Um, I was all over the shop there. By that point, me and Malcolm had a real you know, a way of working together. And he was, he, he certainly wasn't a person who didn't want to credit his staff. Um, he wasn't stingy in that way at all. Um, and, you know, of course, how Gal wouldn't have allowed that because he's a statesman and a, you know, an honorable evolved creature. And, um, and it was funny. There's a lot of, a lot of drinking, you know, a lot of partying by people happenstance though. I mean, my headphones were, blasting loud because we were in headphones the whole time when we track and there the drums are right next to the fucking console and you know how we got that big explosion though in the chorus 
right? No. How it comes on so loud. I would like to know. Well, that. consider there's bleed in every microphone in the entire thing. And all the microphones up to 24 tracks are hot, right? Doesn't matter if we're just running a guitar, you know, drums and bass and a vocal. The B3's on and go into tape. In other words, I didn't unpatch anything. Right. Even right. if it was just idle, it was still if how, which he was want to do, put his guitar down, walked over, and then back over. It was all ready to go. Well, at that point, I just simply unmuted all, because we kept a bunch of the room you know, sounds, they all got unmuted with all the bleed of his guitar screaming on. Plus he hit a pedal then, of course, so the amp screams right. to life. But it also fills at least eight more microphones that have been muted up until that point that still had all the bleed right. you know, too. So we were able to enhance that bleed just with, with more volume and different angles of the explosion of his amp. You know, one of the Mike's happened to be at the top of the stairs on whatever, one back in the hall on another amp that was not being used. When those all came on, when his amp exploded with volume, it gave it that so big that you can hardly even believe. Yeah, that you can't. Out. I mean, and the drums too. And maybe some of oh, that yeah. is bleed. Like, But holy all of shit, it. that track is gigantic. It is. And you know what else happened during that track? And I will never, ever forget this. There was a big storm and we had no isolation and we had no like you know, backup generators or anything, but a lightning storm and we never powered down um, unless like there was a blackout. But there is one snare hit on that song. And if I played it, I could point out which one it is where lightning struck at the exact moment that Johnny hit the snare drum. And I swear to God, there is a lightning crack on top of the snare hit that I later sampled. Um, <laughs> there was this this lightning, it, right at that moment. And when I play it back now, every time I'm not imagining it, I hear the lightning like crack. And then it, to me, it felt like it got recorded right into the, you know, the the substrate of the, of the oxide coating on the tape. Wow. I know there's just ambient noise in the room, but to me, like it actually electrically went through the gear to the head stack and is embedded on the actual snare track with right. the snare drums, transients. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Um, that, that was an awesome record. I still I still listen to it all the time. It's really cool. I was not aware of it, to be honest, until oh, I saw so your list. Cool. And it's great. It's really, really great. Um, so look, the next year is kind of big turning point sort of thing. Because it's the uh, the first Sheryl Crow record that you worked mm -hmm. on. So obviously we have to talk about that. Okay, then happens, I was still under Dan's employ when I did the Giant Sand. Okay. Because, uh, Emmy Lou here, hey buddy. Awesome. I'm, I'm doing a Zoom thing, so I'll be done in a little while. Thanks, that's my son. Um, so Emmy Lou Harris record comes through uh, Victoria Williams, you know, had been in and out of there with um, a couple smaller things, not a whole record, I don't think. The Pearl Jam thing happened. Uh, then the Emmy record, you know, happens to, uh, Giant Sand happens. Then I think Victoria Williams does some stuff there and it's all caught up in that. And then Emmy's record comes and then I quit. And then just a few months later, Cheryl Crow rolled in with her producer, Bill Buttrell. I was already not staff and they had made it very clear that they were bringing their own producer engineer um, and they would just need an assistant. And I was, did, I had no interest in doing it. Um, I didn't want to be anybody's assistant. I was, I, I at that point, I still thought I, I just quit Kingsway. My career's done. I need to be thinking about going to like college for like archeology span or something. Um, but I guess Bill Betrell got upset See, Dan hadn't hired a replacement for me, even though he knew that I was kind of starting to mature into a, a person that, that would be an engineer in her own right. Um, that was what the big fight at Kingsway ended up being about, was me needing independence and him telling me that being grateful that, you know, I even had a job and that I would never go anywhere except for to work for him. Um, that was my future and there was no other future. So, but so there was no assistant to, and believe me, I was the only one at that point that knew how that room worked. And so Karen had to quickly hire an assistant who ended up sucking. And that assistant was not uh, at all capable to handle Bill Petrell or Cheryl Crow. 
and Bill got mad, stuff wasn't working, he walked out. And then uh, they, they, I guess, shoot, uh, Scooter told Karen Brady, the manager, to get somebody in there just for that night to do a setup because uh, Bill had stormed out. I wasn't there for any of that. And so Karen called me and I said no at first because I thought I don't want to be around another pissed off millionaire. They have everything, I have nothing. And I'm not going to be yelled at by some pissed off chick because she's a rock star and she can. But then Karen's like, yeah, but look, I think they'll pay you 200 bucks. It's only going to be like four or five hours. I was like, well, in that case, I'll come down. Yeah. You know, because I was hard, I was broke. And um, so I went down there and, uh, and Scooter, I said, you have to pay me cash. I don't work here. And, uh, and they gave me $200 in cash. And I went up front and I did my setup exactly like I always do. Not Bill Bottrell's, or, you know, aborted setup and not Ron Black's wrong setup. And Cheryl didn't speak to me. Nobody spoke to me. They ignored me. I ignored them. I did my setup. Boom and mics in, you know, they're, they're on the SM7s. They're all writing, got a run back going, um, you know, 47s booming in. And meantime, the whole time I was rolling multi-track. I walked into that room, put up a roll multi-track. I think I was running at uh, 15 so I could get more. And I uh, started rolling tape. Nobody told me to roll tape. Got to run that going. I think she looked over her shoulder one time and said, I hope you're recording to dad. You know, and I was like, we got a dad going. <laughs> I'm rolling. And uh, that's a really uncanny setup. impression, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, they're writing and I'm minding my own business, doing my job, which is to record. And um, they keep going. It's like an hour now. I got like seven rolls of tape at this point. And they start doing home that song home um, and uh, they write it right there, right on the fly. And it was so beautiful. And I mean, I was blown away by her talent. She's so massively talented. Her voice was like ridiculous and, you know, and I, but the fact is I'd never heard her hit single. I didn't know who the fuck she was and I didn't care. I knew that she had some pop single but I didn't know what it sounded like. I had not heard, all I want to do is have some fun. I, certain had, I, had, I certainly hadn't heard like, you know, the amazing songs on that record um, of which there are many. Um, so they write home and there's like 20 minutes of it on tape. And she's like, I don't have to play that dad back. And I was like, well, look, let me just play the multi back. I've got locator points on that. I don't on the dad. You know, who told you to roll tape? And I was like, well, that's what I said. There's not a lot else for me to do up here. What else did you want me to do than record? <laughs> <laughs> so I play the, you know, I roll it back and it's, I fade it in and they love it. And they're like, all right, well, let's cut this. Everything sounds great. The drummer, Brian McLeod, I think it was, uh, drums sound fucking fantastic, you know, and, um, and they try to cut it, right? But it never has that lot, that thing that the writing take had. So ultimately we went back and edited and punched and edited some more and wrote a bridge for and cut in a bridge that very take. And that's why it fades in, because it is the it is the moment of its of its existence on planet Earth, is what you hear on that record. Cheryl liked me after that, and she asked me to come back the next day, until her uh, engineer Blair Lamb or somebody from out in LA could fly out and and do the session. And then by the end of that week, we already had if it makes you happy, every day's winding road, you know maybe angels, and so she's just like well. You're good. So, you know, they ended up staying several weeks or two weeks, whatever it was. And then she took her tapes and she went back to L.A., right? Scooter never told me to run safeties. But of course I ran safeties. Now, mind you, I just ran them onto ADATs because we weren't given a budget to run multi-safeties. And for to do that was a much bigger deal. I had to bring in a whole nother machine, but we had ADATs at that point. So I safetyed all the tapes, uh, every single outtake reels too the whole, you know, 60 rolls or whatever. Yeah, people, we used to burn through a lot more tape than you even have any idea. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the master comp rolls. And, uh, and then I shipped everything out to LA. And then they, their engineer had, you know, goodbye, nice to meet you, really great work. You know, we'll, we'll get your credit right, you know, when this comes out. And so uh, they, um, I get a panicked call, you know, a week or two later that um, did I have any of the run dats from one of the songs that we cut because the engineer had punched a hole in the multi on a bad punch and ruined something bad. And they're like, you know, oh my God, oh my God, you know, maybe we can splice in like the, you know, the run dat, whatever. And I was like, Scooter, I'll just sh ship you the 
the safety. It's on an ADAT, just dump it to multi-track and splice it in. It's an easy edit, you know? I was like, better yet, yeah, I mean, if you want to just ship me the tape, I'll fix it for you and I'll send you back a, a non punched into or whatever, whatever happened. And then, you know, he tells Cheryl, she really, you know, I could hear him. She ran safeties of everything. She's got it all on multi-track. And I'm yelling, no, a dad, a dad, not, mul- not rolls, a dads. And so they're like, you fly your ass out here right now, tonight on the Delta Dash, which do you remember the Delta Dash? <laughs> anyway, it's from <laughs> New Orleans. Delta used to fly every night from uh, New Orleans to Los Angeles oh, and New York, I think, whatever. It was called the Delta Dash. And that's how we used to ship tapes you know, to get there the next right. day because we didn't FedEx them. Um, get on the Delta Dash. We'll have a ticket for you, you know, and bring all the ADATs and uh, come out here. And I did. I flew out with all the ADATs, of course, fixed that problem and went on to be her engineer for a long time. For a very long time. So that worked out. That was pretty good. That worked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked out better for her <laughs> than it and did for me. So at that point, you're just fully independent, right? Was that? Yeah, at that point I am. Yes. Okay. I'm All still right. doing sessions at Kingsway though, whenever possible, because Kingsway is still one of the coolest sounding rooms anybody's ever heard. Right. But you're going so, in there, you're booking yeah, the room. I'm booking the room. I'm where I want to be. And at this point, were you doing any engineering for Malcolm still? Or was yes. that? Yes. Okay. I was still doing engineering for Malcolm. I think we even did like maybe the Junk House record after that. Maybe even, I think I worked you know, on a Tragically Hip record for Mark. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure but not a bunch, you know, it was pretty much after Cheryl, things went in, you know, whatever direction they went after that. I don't, Queens of the Stone Age, you know, Victoria, like other records right. were coming around. So. Well, let's, you mentioned Queens of the Stone Age. So let's talk about Queens of the Stone Age because that first record. So what's, what's the deal with that? Because obviously I know Mr. Breezy quite well as well, but so what's, what's the poop? Well, what does he say the poop is? He went in there. <laughs> well, I believe, if I've got my story straight, is that's one where he went out and there was actually, he just had trouble with the studio and he split. So, yeah, he wasn't there after a bit. I never met him. No? I n- no, I have no idea. It was Chris Goss. Yeah. Was producing. Josh Homme, of course. Nick, uh, did he? No, that's the other Nick. Um, the, the, the. The, the bass player who was the bass player his name was nick right yeah yeah it's not anyway. gonna happen i'm not gonna it's not gonna come out yeah and, and, and the drummer right so i i had no idea um of joe barisi's joe barisi's who we're talking about right yeah well joe joe did the caius records and then i think oh, he was gonna start he? he was gonna start that record and something went weird and then they started it again later you know Chris. what and he he never um that never came up to me no. um i had no idea who he was um um, I know who he is, but I didn't know that because I know all I know is Josh Homme contacted me and said, I want you to track my record um, out in Los Angeles at Sound City, Sound City on Sylvia Massey's Neve. And, um, and my, you know, it's going to be produced by myself and Chris Goss. And I was like, I have no clue who you are. I never heard of Caius. And I don't, I cannot imagine why the hell you're calling me. And I love Josh for this. He said, because you're a chick and you don't know anything about where I come from. And I was like, right the fuck on. You got that straight. <laughs> I think they'd heard of me from the desert, too, because I used to hang out with Fred uh, Drake and um, and Dave Catching, you know, out there at Rancho de la Luna, which was Fred's studio in, uh, in Joshua Tree. And they were all kind of running around Pioneer Town and stuff. Well, okay, so, so how did that happen? So, because you were still living in New Orleans, but you went out to LA. A bit. So no. how did you end out oh, in the oh, desert? Oh. We missed well, this. Well, here, you, this is, I, 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 I skipped over this briefly and, I, and I'll go back now. When I got back to LA after being in London and hanging out with Hugh and all that, um, and I took that little school and I was back in LA for about six months and Hugh was there with Susan Rogers. My friend, uh, he, uh, Fred had a rehearsal room in Hollywood for his band, Fred Drake, and his friend Dave Ketching was at that like rehearsal room one night. And then they somehow knew Hugh and it had to do with weed. <laughs> and so I ended up down at that rehearsal room and I met Fred and I met Dave 
And I was like, oh yeah, I want to be an engineer. And Fred was real nice to me. And he kind of helped me learn like the little soundcraft board he had set up. And then I think he actually lived in Los Angeles then. And then um, he moved to that house in Joshua Tree, but I already knew Fred. So I knew Fred and I knew he, um, and Fred liked me a lot. And we just got along really good. So then, you know, when I went to New Orleans, like six, four or five, six months later, like I kind of kept in touch with Fred. And then as things started to develop, for me, I always stayed in touch with Fred out in the desert. Fred was also getting sicker and sicker because he had AIDS. So, you know, um, all of us knew Fred and I knew Dave Ketching and we just always liked each other enough to where we stayed in touch. So I think that might've been how Josh Homme even heard of me right. in the first place. And so just desert talk, because he wouldn't have called me if he didn't trust, he wouldn't have called me, Ooh, she worked on Cheryl Crow, he wouldn't have given a fuck about that. It would have come from somewhere else by some means well, that he would you don't know about in. that though because like he he got a hold of mark rankin because of the stuff he did with paul epworth like he he listens yeah, to all so. kinds of shit so, so you don't know but he wanted me because i was a chick specifically and i didn't know anything about like the kind the of desert. records or, or i didn't know anything about like metal like thick, you know metal like big metal records with big guitar sounds that wasn't my area right right so yeah and then he said because then i could tell you what to do and you'll do it you won't argue with me i was like you got that right what do you want i'll give it to you i mean like what do you want you wanted me to turn up 600 hertz on that eight, on that uh uh ssl equalizer to the point where it cancels out all other frequencies and that's your guitar tone yep now, mind you, we were going through Rod Stewart's all tech bass rig for his guitar tone, which was tuned down. And, you know, what I mean, so. Yeah. But yeah, I was like, sure, man, you know, I'll do whatever you want, because I, I'm not you're, you're going to tell me what you want and I'm going to do it. And I did. Every and, time. And there you have it. And so we got along. I mean, he, he didn't ever call it again, so he didn't. He must not have liked it that much. But the record came out really well. Well, well, he got too famous yeah. for me. Once you, people get to a certain famousness, they got no reason to go backwards. They got to go forwards. Well, okay. And so here's where I may have been getting confused. So that that's on rated R you're talking yeah. about. Did you? So you didn't work at all on the first record? No. Oh, okay. Because that that was the I'm, Joe. Okay. So that that's yeah. my confusion. I somewhere I saw credit for you on the first one, but it's just the internet being yeah. the internet. Yeah, I've never. I met them for um, rated R, and I worked, and I did mix. Uh, um, a, like a live surround sound thing right after Katrina. It was some, not an important record and certainly not a studio record. Right, right, It right. was just okay. something. Um, but yeah, Josh was good to me. Um, I think he got what he wanted and he never called again, but I love him and I think he's a fucking genius and I love Dave Ketching and I love all those guys. So, all right, but now we've, our timeline, oh my God, we've gone ahead in time and we have to go back in time to the Globe Sessions. Cause do I have time to pee again? Yes, of course. Sorry. Okay. No, I'll no, right it's back. fine. I'll show them my toothpick right. again. It's nice. It's cool. <laughs> it's nice. It's double ended, so you, if you break off part of it between your teeth, you can just spin it around, which is cool. Um, I got a hat here that my wife knitted. I could put that on for a second. You know what the best part is? I don't edit the podcasts, so this is going to be in the podcast when it comes out with no video. So they're going to hear about the toothpick, but they're not going to be able to see the toothpick or the hat. And I think there's something really amusing about that to me. Um, I hope we're not shedding viewers at the moment because we're about to get into some great shit and we're about to talk Chad Blake. So that's very important as well. So you stay with me because she's coming back. I don't really have much else to show you. My cat, I got one cat asleep on the couch over there, and I don't know where the other cat is. Um, but my cats are named Squid and Mole, in case you the don't train know. The has returned. And I was, I was just explaining to everybody that my cats are named Squid and Mole, and I do that to confuse predators, because they won't yes. know that they're cats. No. I love kitties. Mm. Okay, I, I bored the shit out of them, so you now need to, to reel them back in. What I want to know is how many are out there. Mark, come on. Uh, we, get, we don't get the numbers till after, but he can, well, maybe uh, he can get a number. He might. It's 12. It's, no, it is in the thousands. 
It is absolutely <laughs> in the thousands, I'm telling you. So, Globe Sessions. Yes. Shall we talk about that record? Sure, and I'll just tell the people because I won't tell who it is. I know who my favorite mistake is actually about. All right. You're my favorite mistake. Yeah. It is not who everybody thinks it's about. There you go. All right. Well, that's some cliffhanger shit, so let's move on. <laughs> You're my favorite mistake. But let's talk about yeah. that record because from what I understand, and I could be totally wrong, you were cutting that record on a single 24-track machine. You were not yeah. hooking up slaves, not running extra tracks, or maybe you did, but... Yeah, we did eventually. Okay, but you were being quite bold in your choices for the people who track every single microphone separately on every single instrument ever. You had drums down to mono on some of these songs, yes. right? Yes, and, and I was doing that on Cheryl Crow, Cheryl Crow too. Like all of the, they would want to overdub a whole new drum kit um, and we had loops going. And so I would, you know, have 12 mics all live, but I would literally bust them and record them down to one track. It wasn't because I was so creative and awesome. It was because they wanted to do more and we were limited to 24 tracks. So the only way to record a drum kit is to record it on one track because we only have two tracks left. And we weren't slaved up at that point. Right. And you weren't going to drag the ADATs behind it or anything mm -mm. like that. Well, we started doing more stuff like that. But that was another gift from Dan and them, you know, because back, you know, previous to this, it was, you know, I mean, I come from a time before there were even ADATs. So, yeah. you know, you could overdub stuff. You could, you just, you bounced. You bounced your drums down to stereo pair and then you did a whole nother kit and then you bounced that down. And then you picked between the two, but you were stuck with your stereo blend. And so you had to make that work, but then their next decisions were based on the EQ of that set in stone drum pass that right. you weren't going to be able to modify. So you had to set your tones for anything else you did to honor that. And we worked that way. And I always worked that way. So Shell Crow, Shell Crow and Globe Sessions, I always, man, I always bounce the drums. I want a bunch of fucking drum tracks hanging around there. There's, there's, did they get in my nerves? <laughs> I, like I love them too. So, all right. So anything in particular about that record other than when it gets sent off to be mixed? Now, I'd like to ask you a question about that. So you're freelance now. You've had a lot of success off that first Cheryl record that you did. The Cheryl Crow, Cheryl Crow. I love that you, right. the record's so nice they named it twice as opposed to her eponymous or whatever. Right. Um, did you have any kind of ego about whether or not you were going to be mixing at this point? Or no. you were you were an engineer, you were there to record, that was your gig. Yes, mixing is such a high art form that I knew that I was nowhere near ready or had this did I didn't have the skills to mix yet. And were you did you know it was going to Chad? Yes. So in advance, like that decision was made, you knew that shit was going to him and you knew- I didn't know it would go to Andy Wallace. I didn't right. know she was going to split it out. But I knew that after Cheryl Crow, Cheryl Crow did so well with this particular team she had, um, she was going to have Chad mix it, me record it and- Right. And you were you know. pretty well aware of Chad, not just from the Cheryl record at that point, or did you- Oh yeah, I was in yeah. love with Chad. Yeah. yeah. I mean, not just, I mean, I, I was in love with Chad Blake. I mean, I wanted to marry him. But I knew he didn't want to marry me, so I knew that it was not realistic, just like I'm in love with Ted Neely to this day. I hope Ted's out there. Um, <laughs> no, he was the most brilliant, evolved, decent, kind, helpful, hurt, could understand my hurt, held my hand, told me he loved my sounds, told me I was pretty, but I wasn't for him. You know, all of it gave me really good scotch one night that tasted so yummy and showed me what a DVD was and like, how that was going to change the world. And he was just so wonderful. And he was so talented that all I wanted to do was whatever could make Chad happy, including record records that he'd be happy when he mixed. That's awesome. Because there was an interview you did where you described a phone call that you got from him. And it just sounded exactly like Chad to me, the way you said it, where he said, look, I don't know who you are, but I love what you're doing with the drums. There it is. Oh, hello. 
<laughs> look at there's Trina and there's Chad. Look at them, so gorgeous. Yeah, love you. Yeah, all right. Yeah, Sound Factory Studio B. No, that was that actually. Uh, oh, where's that? The Globe Studios that Cheryl set up in that building in the uh, Meatpacking District in New York. Oh, right. I was unaware. Yeah. Yeah, making a big mistake. Now, did he mix there? He or he mixed it? No, no, he mixed, he mixed at um at, at the room. He always mixed. Yeah, in. Um, Sound Factory B. Studio B. Yeah, but he was just hanging out. Um, he was taking some pictures, and he was in town for something else. Right. And then he came to the studio and hung out with us for a few days, which was awesome. That's great. I'm glad that he's in the picture because he's such a great photographer, but he's not always in his own pictures. Yes. So. So Chad's going to mix it. I know it. And all I want to do is survive the recording. <laughs> Did it feel like that? Like yeah. this was a record you had to survive? Yes. In a different way than the record before? Cheryl had, um, no, it was more of the same, except for Cheryl was more famous and richer and therefore was in turning into that like that bubble that surrounds um wealth and fame that by the way the artist can't help it it's done almost to them by the surroundings that they find themselves in that thing of where reality doesn't touch the artist we deal with reality and they live in the non-real world of money and wealth and stature and fame so she had to deal with all of that. And is this going to be her failure, not sophomore, I guess, junior, her second production of right. herself? Will it fail? You know, let's watch her fail. There are a lot of people who wanted Cheryl Crow to fail, fail. I don't know why. You know, they would have thought it was, would have been great to see her fall on her ass. Um, and she was, just had to tough it out and produce this amazing record. Um, she wasn't nice to be around most of the time. No, I'm not going to say that she was. Everybody would know I'm a liar who was in those rooms. I mean, Cheryl screamed at me one day telling me that if she's not creative, I don't eat. Okay, well, I went and got a bagel from downstairs <laughs> on that moment and came up and ate it. And that's why Cheryl and I were able to, you know, work together for a little while. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, have we lost her? I certainly hope not. Because I can only show you this toothpick so many times. Um, hold on. Let me, uh, I'm going to switch over to my email and uh, see if I can find out what happened with Trina's internet. Hopefully, nothing terrible. So hold on one second here. I'm just going to scroll through my email here. And Mark, you'll keep an eye out in case she's trying to rejoin. Um, oh, you're back. Wow, that was weird. You're back. Well, wow. see, now while you were gone, I said, well, what should I talk about? Mark texted me to say people are asking what's under the blanket, and I would refer them to your first pee break because I told them what's under the blanket. And they weren't yeah, paying attention. There's they, new people. They weren't paying attention. Okay, so so we were talking about about Cheryl being a little bit difficult. And I got a question for you to go back to her self-producing. So obviously on the second record, Cheryl Crow, Cheryl Crow, she was not planning on producing that record. She came in with a very successful, high profile producer to make the record with her. Was that something that was her choice and then it just didn't work out and she decided, well, I guess I'll do it myself as plan B or was she sort of wanting to do it anyway? Do you know? You know, I, I, I guess the answer is I don't know, but in hindsight, it appeared that even if she didn't know it herself, um, the minute that Bill Battrell walked out of that room, Cheryl Crow must have known on some level that she was going to produce her own record. So there was never a thought of like, oh shit, now I got to go find a producer. It was like, well, we're making a fucking record, so we're making a record. All I know is that by the time I showed up several hours later that night, uh, they, she, Jeff, uh, Jeff, Jeff I think Jeff, Jeff was already there. Right. Um, Brian. Uh, anyway, uh, no, you know what? 
it was just Cheryl and Bill to start with. And then he split. She felt probably completely abandoned and afraid, um, alone in a New Orleans mansion, you know, and nothing had gone right. So she was flying Jeff Trot in, I think that very night he arrived. I think she, it must have coalesced in her brain between the time he left and Jeff Trot and Brian McLeod arrived. And certainly my arrival a few hours later that she would produce herself because right. when I walked in, she was going to produce her own record with Jeff. Right. Well, cause she, I mean, basically if you think about it, it's just she cherry picked one person out of the Tuesday Night Music Club and then just decided, well, fuck that, he's gone. We'll get the rest of the club in instead, in a way. So it, it's back to her comfort zone. Yes. But without Bill. Right. And without Bill, what she had to show, and she had to show the whole world, and she did, was that she wasn't just the voice, the attractive, you know, good singing medium talented chick that Tuesday Night Music Club had used as their lead vocalist and that she was the actual core of the nature of that record. That record sounded like it did because Cheryl Crow sounds like she does and she writes like she does and she is what she is because she was able to recreate her own version of that better than Tuesday Night Music Club in some ways um, with a you know largely different set of people sometimes and you know, in other words, it's her voice. It's what she can do on a B3 and on a piano. Yeah. That is why Tuesday Night Music Club, any, anybody gave a shit about it. It wasn't because of Bill Bottrell. Yeah, I mean, and I think people don't, I mean, she had been working her ass off forever. I mean, she was a background singer on the Bad Tour. Yeah. She, like, was... She worked hard for what yeah. she got. Yeah. And she deserves everything that she has. Um, you know, Cheryl being hard to be around was because... Look, I have yet to meet a person that has several million dollars sitting around that doesn't treat most of the other people in their life, especially if they're subordinate, like shit. Do you know any? I'd love to say yes and start reeling off names, but I'd have to think about it. I mean, you know, there is know a, a, there is a. Do you know anybody who doesn't have millions of dollars? That's a lot of fun to be with and doesn't have all that pressure and therefore is in a bad mood a lot. Yeah, I know quite a few people without millions of dollars right. who are a lot of fun to be around. But you don't know, you can't name a single you no, know, but I, but I was thinking this more just in terms of like the just record making. And obviously, like as you say, you thought like sort of the and I, I'm just changing the subject a little bit. I realize I'm going off topic, but it goes back to the Kingsway thing where you feel like that's the way records are made. And then it turns out there are producers who are nice to everybody. But there are other producers who are even meaner to right. other people. And it, it's always a spectrum. But That's because production, as I have now finally learned after 35 years, production is not a person. There's no such thing as a record producer. Sorry to tell you that. Production is an architecture that allows a record to be made. Sometimes it's named a person. But the fact is, it's always a collaboration. It always was, it always will be. The person who claims to be the producer on a record is a liar. They are an architecture that allows a record to be made. That is my quote that comes from me and I'll finish it with another one. All right. There was enough income generated off of one Sheryl Crow record, Sheryl Crow, Sheryl Crow, to have made comfortable all of the key players in that record, all let's say 15 people who are responsible that that record exists at all. Everybody could have ended up being able to buy a house, paying off a car and socking away some money for their kids' education one day down the road. Instead, it went to make three people massively wealthy and the rest of us didn't get shit. Do you know how much I got paid to record all of Cheryl Crow, Cheryl Crow? I'm about to. $6,000. And nobody topped me off. Nobody came back and said, Jesus, without her, this certainly wouldn't exist. She worked like a slave in the corn. They don't top you off by, behind. It. And so to me now, any production that makes an artist and a producer rich, they can both go fuck themselves. Because everybody in that room decide, should have gotten a half a million dollars 
out of the millions that were made. And that would have set all the musicians, the co-writers, maybe they got theirs, I don't know, the crew, the rest of us. And it would just be like 15 people, but they're intrinsic to the fact that the record exists because they are part of the production. And that's my opinion. And I'm just naming Cheryl Crow as an example of a record that generated enormous wealth yeah, yeah, that yeah. did not. Yeah. It's all over the place. Yeah. I mean, and it's, I, it's never. And I, you know. and I don't think that's right. And that's why I will not acknowledge anymore somebody who calls themselves the producer. You're not. You're either a player or you're an engineer or a writer. The production is all of us. It's everybody. So get over yourself. All right, then. Sorry if you guys don't like to hear it that way. No. I... Producers. But for <laughs> real. You know it. You live it. You yeah. live it. Now, I'm producing a record right now for my friend Andrew Duhon, who's a genius, and the record's going to be huge, and it's going to take the world by storm, and everybody will just go, oh, my God. And it'll say produced by Trina Shoemaker. You know why? He insists on it. And I've begged him. Let's just say, it's pretty, but doesn't matter. Do you know what will happen with any income generated from that record? And this... These instruments already exist. It will be disseminated to the key players, the musicians, the other engineers who helped me during the tracking session. We will all get an equal portion, even though I will have done most of the work. Right. Because without them, it doesn't matter what I'm doing in here now, it wouldn't exist at all. So why should I get a bunch of money and Justin, the tracking engineer from Dockside, get the, you know, the $2,000 he got paid? Why isn't he getting a hundred grand? Right. If I'm getting 500. You know what I mean? It's just like it's bullshit. So anyway, enough on that. It's no, never happen. I, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it isn't enough on that. I think that's a, it's a really, because obviously there's the teeniest, teeniest bit of it with royalties for some people on records and not, but then of course it means there's not royalties for everybody else. Right. And it's like, I remember, there was a time just, and I'm only bringing up Joe Breezy because I was at his studio when it happened, but I got, I went over there to say hi to Joe because I went to school with Joe, so I've known him forever. So I went over and he was doing something with Atticus Ross and I was really excited to meet Atticus because I just, I love how creative he is and blah, blah, blah. So Joe said, well, come on over and you can meet him. So I come in and Joe introduces me and he says, oh, and Joe says like, hey, it's my friend Andrew. He's, you know, worked with the Chili Peppers, just did something on that Adele record. And Atticus shakes my hand and says oh you must be a very wealthy man and all i'm thinking is <laughs> i got fucking day rate on that and i'm not complaining yeah. about the day rate like right. it was good and i loved making i mean i'd i'd almost have paid to work with the chili peppers when i started with those guys but were you on um, up with mofo party plan no god i all wish because right. when i worked at Capitol, that record came out and that was awesome yeah that anyway, that is I was a big fan of theirs before that. I mean, I saw them in 86 in like a punk club in Miami when I was at school and things. But that record with Behind the Sun, Behind the Sun yeah. was transformative to me. Yeah. It's like, who the fuck are these guys that they can do that? That was one of the records for the alternative marketing department that got assigned to the alternative marketing department because nobody knew what to do with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> but that's the one where they put the, um, the tube socks over their dicks and that's yeah. the album cover. But that very same year, I saw them with Jane's Addiction and uh, Thelonious Monster at the Hollywood Bowl. Wow. Crazy show. What yes. order were people on then? I'm assuming Thelonious opened. They opened, and then it was uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, and then and Jane's then Addiction. Because Jane's Addiction was huge right then. Nothing shocking had just come out. Oh, and, right. Okay. Yeah. Right. So anyway, pretty cool. They, that's a good show. I still love Jane's Addiction. Can't help it. That was <laughs> well, some good shit, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing. Okay, so back, though. Back to Globe yes. Sessions. Yes. Globe Sessions Globe was sessions. a wonderful experience. Um, <laughs> Chad mixed it and then Andy got involved and he was one of the coolest people I've ever ever met in my entire life and I model myself after Andy largely. Are you collecting um, cars? No <laughs> but it was just the way that Andy was unflappable no matter what you did that's pretty cool. What did you think of that Andy? Can I impress you? Is there any way because Cheryl made me go to the mixes Right. I wasn't going to be the mixer, but she wanted me there because she was used to the rough mixes and she was worried that they would do stuff that she wasn't going to like. And I knew what she was going to like and what she wasn't going to like. So she actually made me go, which was wildly embarrassing because Andy Wallace doesn't want me sitting in there and neither does Chad, except for oddly, they both did. They liked me. 
And even if I said, she's not going to like it if you don't keep those panned, she wants those panned. Oh, all right. You know, they were so friendly. So that's why it's like, I never had trouble with dudes in the studio. They were always cool. Maybe they, maybe they were just glad to have a chick around. But yeah, so I was a present for both of the mixes. Just right. Top to bottom. Wow. And how, I mean, it's hard to imagine two different, two more different mixers in a way. Yeah. They're very different. Whole different ways and ways to get sounds and yet the record is is seamless so with... how did they split the record up how'd you decide who was mixing what did any... chad mixed the entire record record and cheryl didn't think that the singles oh right were okay. what she wanted and she wanted andy to do the singles and he did a better job than what chad had done sorry chad but i mean it's just true um uh chad and chad had already mixed them and the tone of the record was already defined via chad's interpretation of sounds that frankly were mine yeah and you know and so and if the drums are mono Cheryl, the drums are mono andy's not yeah putting samples exactly them, and so know. but then there were certain songs you know like even my favorite mistake i'm pretty sure andy mixed my favorite mistake she wanted a more elegant slightly more you know um i guess less chadish and more andy-ish you know uh, right feel on those Right. And I love that that Andy was the choice because you would think at that point you'd be thinking Bob Claremountain or something like that, because Andy, everyone thinks of Andy as the hard rock guy and all that. But of course, that fucking Jeff Buckley record, you know. Right. I know. I mean, and he wasn't. He did so many other things. He just wasn't famous for those ones. But Cheryl was very well aware of, of, of what Andy did. And of course, you know, I don't know really i mean all i just know she said andy wallace is going to mix some of these stuff you got to be in new york in you know three days right so off i went that's staying awesome at the so staying at the soho grand hell yeah <laughs> nice back in the day <laughs> okay so a little milestone thing happens off this record the first female to win best engineered record non-classical probably best engineered record period because i don't know if any female engineers won the classical one either and so you're nominated for this that must have been pretty cool i'd imagine because as much as anybody who could hate on this or that or whatever but grammys are actually pretty fucking cool to be nominated for and especially to win totally um well first off i was overwhelmed because i didn't even know when it was brought to my attention that you know you've been nominated for a Grammy. I, of course, just assumed Cheryl's record was nominated for something, and that was exciting, just like, you know, Cheryl Crow, Cheryl Crow had been. Um, but then Chad called, and he's like, did you hear the news? And in my mind, I didn't delineate. I didn't think that my work as the engineer was relevant. I thought the record was being nominated because Chad and Andy mixed it. It's not self-deprecating. I just contextually, I assumed these really famous guys mixed the record. Therefore, it's being nominated for the Best Engineer Award because they're the mixers and I'm kind of along for the ride. And I guess I felt that way pretty much up until Chad. I got out to LA, my dress looked terrible. It was too tight. My hair was awful. I was uncomfortable. I was scared. I didn't know where I was supposed to go. I didn't have anybody to go with me. I wasn't going to be going with Cheryl and them because they don't weren't going to have me in their car. So Chad's like, you can come with me and uh, we'll get a car. And he basically said, no, it's got as much to do with you as it does Andy and me. We're, we're, so it's, got to, it's all three of us. It's all three of our award equally. And I guess I still didn't even believe that even after they handed me the fucking statue. Which they take away, by the way. Yeah, I know. It's not. I thought it was the thing. Anything. I was like, no, this is mine. They're so like, no, no, this is actually just a prop. That's a we'll fake give one. It. That's a fake one. After the after parties were um, just brutal, I stood there. Nobody spoke to me. Uh, nobody knew who I was. Nobody cared. And I went back to Chad's house, smoked some weed, and called my friends. You know, <laughs> so it, it wasn't like I was hanging around with, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the, the famous woman who was in front of me at the Grammys, whose dress, you know, got stepped on by this other person, uh, Shania Twain. <laughs> and it was all about Cheryl, you know, and I know that I already knew that. And it would be about then about Andy and Chad. And it was not going to be about me. It wasn't. And I knew my I knew enough to know that it would be best if I just went back to the house and got the dress off and 
Oh, but now would be a good time. Yes, now would be a great time. I was going to ask if you were going to show this because here's a little Here document. An analog photo of me and Chad in the limo getting ready to go to get out of the car to go to the Grammys. I am not passed out. No. It looks as though he's given me a drug. Yes. And had to drag me in, but he didn't. It's just a weird picture. And that, that is on the way there or on the way back? On the way there. On the way there. Now, can I just point out, and I'd like to have you confirm or deny this, it looks as though Chad, and I'm going to be generous here, is wearing a bunch of lip gloss. Um, yeah, it What's does. Going on? What's going on with and that? And I'm thinking he probably had on chapstick or like Carmex. Because this yeah. was, would have been like January or February. So it was actually pretty... It was cold. Yeah. I remember being cold. And she, no, you know what? It's definitely Carmex because it's all the way up here too. Okay. All right. Because I wouldn't I wouldn't have had him pegged as a lip gloss kind of guy. No, he wasn't. He was dressed. Um, God, he's so young. We were both so young. Um, <laughs> he was um, Cowboy dressed, chic. You know, yes. In a perfect outfit. And he intentionally rented an old timey limousine. Not like really old. Not like, you know the monsters <laughs> but like like a vintage limousine that was like real cool you know that had almost like deco whatever he he knew what to do i did not know what to do he handled it i was there and i mean he got a kick out of it because i say shit unfiltered shit that other people won't say and it makes chad i've laugh. noticed yeah, yeah so yeah, chad in that, that way you know um it it, it was you know I guess it made him, and he didn't have a girlfriend at that time, and so it was good enough. I never slept with Chad, though. I don't want anybody to do that. <laughs> we don't, I tried. Okay. <laughs> he said no. All right. Well, I'm glad we got that out in the open. Yeah. Well, the way I gush about him, it would seem like maybe I, had, Look, I have not. I gush about him like that, and I haven't slept okay, well, with him either. So. Okay. Well, both of us have lost out. Exactly. Exactly. Now, maybe you tried harder than me, but I probably would yeah. have. You know, yeah. <laughs> he's so cool. Man. Yeah, he's he's the best. And Jackie, Jackie's as cool. She's like the woman engineer from England. But Absolutely. I was like, oh my god, there's another one of me. I didn't know about you. So but I also knew that. All right, we're almost at three hours. Just so you know, and I, all right. I know that you don't want to do the 19-hour marathon that some people. I just do. won't be able to because I will have to take my son to Yamani Brazilian okay. Jiu-Jitsu. So look, we can. <sighs> I mean, there's a lot of shit that happened. Obviously, like that is this is just the we can beginning. do it again. We can do a part two. Yeah, because I like this. I get it now, and I'm I'm comfortable. And we, well, we all right, let's plan on doing a part two. But what I would like to do is kind of get you to Nashville. Maybe can we get right. that far? Yeah, we well, can there's go a hell of a lot minutes. to do. There's a lot to do in between and i'd love to do a q a now too let's just do like one or two things because right after rated r because now we're back up to 2000 so in 2001 you got a blues traveler record but you also have a something for kate record and i yes, believe this is your first full-on production yes right yeah it it is it essentially for a for a signed band that gets a major label release um that has a significant budget not you know like huge um, yeah, I guess it would have been, there would have been small things that nobody ever heard of that I was kind of producing along the way. Um, but it would have been my first big, you know, bigger record for me. Yeah. And Australian band. You made that f first record in Australia. Do I have this right? Yes. I, yeah. Yes. I made both. I made two records for them, both in Australia. Right. Um, and it was at Gary Beers' studio, who was uh, the bass player for In Excess. And Michael Hutchins had, you know, passed away not that terribly long before. Um, but, you know, uh, that was pretty recent. And so that was still kind of a, a strange haunting of that uh, corner of the earth. Right. I guess you could say. I mean, they were still really in mourning. You know, it's funny, though, during that record, it just turns out that their lawyer, Gary Beers' lawyer, and it might have even been something for Kate's lawyer, also was the lawyer for ACDC. And while the In Excess guys were mourning the loss of, of the late, great Michael Hutchins, he just said, you know how long the band mourned Angus? I mean, I mean uh, um, Bon Scott when he died. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, about three days. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
you know, this had been a few years later that that Michael Hutchins had died. So went out, and he just thought it was fun. I mean, they just replaced his ass immediately right. and carried yeah, well, on. Well, they kind of did. And I'm gonna I'm gonna search through my phone only because you're gonna talk about Australia for a second. But when I was in Australia, I went to this amazing art gallery that was all photographs. And there was a picture of Angus from the 70s that is just insane. So, <laughs> and I think you'll really like it. So I'm going to show it to you, but you're going to have to talk about uh, that making that record. I will. So making that record, again, Gary Beers' studio, but interestingly, once you get to a residential studio, whether you're in Australia or you are in Los Angeles or Nashville, you end up in the same exact environment. There's the con everything's the same except for like the milk is pack packaged differently, the cheese is <laughs> packaged differently, and there are a different set of flora and fauna that make noise at night. Um, we had a lot of uh, they're not kangaroos, but they look just like them. They're like small kangaroos. What are those things called? Um, the wallabies. Yes. Oh, wow. How fucking great is that picture? That's so great. He's like 11. Yeah. He's so, t he's so young. Yeah, I mean, he's wearing his school uniform because he's actually still in school. Because he's actually still yeah. in school, exactly. Okay, anyway, sorry. So we're talking about wallabies. Um, anyway, they would um, they would hop around at night, and they're smaller than kangaroos. But, you know, again, coming from Joliet, Illinois, a kangaroo or a wallaby are not in my... <laughs> and I would get really scared in my cabin at night because there's like little places, you know, for the... It was a house with a studio, but then they had built little, you know, houses for people to stay. And, you know, you'd hear them at night pound. They would like kick the side of the building or made a great deal of noise. And um, I always found that really scary to walk back and forth because I was afraid I might get jacked by a wallaby. <laughs> and that's like also... one of that's one of only four animals in Australia that won't kill you. Everything right, else exactly. will actually kill you. But, you know, we're out in the, like, their version of the woods, which is, I guess, the out, whatever. This place was residential out in the middle of nowhere. Dude, there were spiders, like, that big. And they could build nests overnight. Like, so that you, I, I carried a huge pole anytime <laughs> I left the studio to go to my house. Because you might walk through a spider web. Um, wallabies, scary spiders. Otherwise, Paul Dempsey was an absolute... Uh, mental and musical genius. Um, Stephanie, his partner, brilliant. Cliff, you know, in other words, the whole, that band was very, very cool. We had so much fun making those records. And I felt like I was starting to come into my own uh, in terms of really understanding what sound needed and what I could do for it, how I could serve it. Well, okay, so what do you mean by that? Meaning to this day, to this very moment when we end and tonight I launch my session and I work on Andrew's record. Sound, my knowledge and my relationship with sound grows exponentially every minute that I'm in its presence. So by the next minute, I can't believe that I even existed before that minute. Like I, I couldn't possibly be have been doing good work because now I finally really understand what a guitar needs to be doing. Do you know, it's like, it's, yeah. I've never, I, I have yet to reach my peak of my relationship with sound. And that's what I'm all about. I don't actually even care about artists. I mostly don't want them around. Actually, I don't want them around at all. I want the song and then I want to do stuff to the sound. And uh, I serve the song. I do not serve the artist. Once they recorded it, they gave it to the world. I purchased my copy. Belongs to me. Um, it's not theirs anymore. It's mine. And um, so, yeah, sound is just constantly revealing itself to me. And so in that moment, though, I felt like I understood some of the natures of the end game. I can't I don't really know how to explain that. Well, and did you feel as though through any of this stuff after you left Kingsway and you're on your own and you're really starting to figure things out for yourself as opposed to being told what to do did you feel as though you needed to unlearn anything or did you feel more it was you had to get your brain and soul around what you already knew could happen the, the latter absolutely i and again to this day it's not about me and it's not even about the sounds it's about the song so i'm still waiting i've had many wonderful songs pass through me amazing songs but the singular song that will be my stay with me my midnight rider my dear mr fantasy my let me roll it my que sera, sera my karina you know the, the the one song 
that will be of the artist, their writing, their performance, but of me in my actual nature hasn't even happened yet. That voice that will bring me to my knees has not come for me yet. It's not Cheryl Crow, it's not Josh Homme, it's not any of them. I'm still waiting. Um, and so in the meantime, every time I raise a fader and the song is upon me, whether I'm getting ready to track, getting sounds or in the middle of a mix, my communing with the sound is brand new and everything that I have to learn, I have to learn in that moment for that song and bring that one across the plate brand new, like I've never done before. I can never wow. repeat myself. And how, okay, so I've got so many questions about this just because I'm fascinated about it. So first of all, within a recording project, when you're doing a record and you got 12 songs to do and you're going from one song to the next to the next, how much are you like tearing down or changing as you go from song to song? Do you feel like the project ends up getting a sound or is it really from song to song things have got to change no, they, the, the sonic, the, the sound, or, uh, for example, um, if I'm going to track a record and we've got 12 songs and we're all set up in the studio, I'm not song to song going to run out and move the drums from their right. successfully mic'd area. Um, it's all about what does the drummer play and how does it feel and how do I interpret that feel to be utterly brand new? I'm not going to go out and actually change the EQ on the kick drum. The kick drum is just the carrier of the foot of the right. drummer you know so it's what is this song asking me to do what is i make up incredibly detailed fantasies for almost every song unless i despise the song that again passes through me in any role whether it's as producer engineer mixer or just mixer um my i have elaborate fantasies about, about the song um i mean literally visual like hallucinations and I let the song you know bring me to that place and then I go out to serve that place that I want the song to live in I give it an environment that the artist knows nothing about and it certainly has nothing to do with their re reality with their piece of writing um, they're utterly selfish I've never not been able to do it every single one that's why I had to write the fucking book to start with because I just have so much my imagination is wild and songs carry my imagination for me and they carry stories for me that have nothing to do with the artist, the recording session or anything. So I'm constantly trying to create a story out of the work in front of me that is utterly selfish and self-serving. And There's is it always a story that you could put into words or it's just- Yes. Really? Yeah, it actually would have dialogue and characters and that are doing things during wow. the song. And it might like, have nothing to do with the lyrics or- yeah, very, very little to do with the lyrics. Like it has to do with that song existing as a carrier of a moment in a fantasy that I have with my characters and what they're doing. So for example, Que Sera Sera, that's a Sly Stone cover of a Doris Day song. Um, but I have a very specific fantasy that goes along with that song. And I didn't record that song. That's just one I listened to um, that I've had for years of an interaction that takes place between a person, two people, while that song plays. I, wow. it's, hard to, it's, it's hard to describe, so but that's it, in my it's, book. It's like a picture of that song's impact on someone's life as yes. it plays. Yes, and that's the story so it's that not, I... So it's not even the song, but it's what that song is capable of in the world. Yes, exactly. That is exactly well put. I have never been able to alliterate it in just that way, but and, and my entire career has been spent in these fantasies, mutually exclusive to a real life most of the time, which is why I'm a recluse, which is why I'm not on social media, which is why I, I'm not on social media mainly because it doesn't interest me. I just don't care what other people are doing because I have this whole fake, this fantasy life that I live out for my characters who I've had in my body for a very long time, So uh, since childhood. So if you're producing a record, and there you start working on a song and you start to build up this picture of what it is but it turns out that the artist's vision of where the song's going to go doesn't fit with that what do you do how do you deal make, with that i make up a new vision you just make up a new I, story yeah That's i just cool. have to come up with a new fantasy like if i'm thinking hey this could be great if it was just acoustic guitar you know maybe a little bit of um percussion and uh, an upright bass and they're like oh no no i want full kit 
you know, big, big loud guitars that I just have to recreate, recalibrate. Now, mind you though, I do have to care about the song. Now there are songs that I find so boring um, that it, I struggle. And those usually will still get a treatment and get a special treatment, but they won't necessarily get a fully flushed. But I can promise you at least half of every single record I have ever been a part of has had a fully flushed fantasy written for it that I still remember. And I'm sorry to keep going on about it, but I just find this absolutely fascinating. So do you like spend time working on them or they just come to you and they stick? Uh, generally they come to me and they stick, but I open my mind to them. In other words, because my brain has always operated this way where external stimuli, especially art, um, <clears throat> triggers my fantasy world into being um, that, you know, I, I, I'm open to it already. So then it's just kind of like, what do I got for this? Where is this? You know, and they can take place all over the world. It's, you know, it's not like coolest version of synesthesia I've ever heard about. So instead of it being connecting sound with vision, you're like connecting sound with literature. Yeah, a plot that, but, but the characters have been around for a long time. And so the characters rarely shift, but new ones come in all the time. Chad Blake became a very permanent character really? in my scheme. Oh yes. Wow, so Chad, um, some shit happens to Chad while listening to the songs that you're working on. Yeah, but in you know in the fantasy he doesn't he's not Chad Blake. He no, no, is no. the essence. Yeah, he's the he's, essence. He's of, like when you're dreaming yeah. and you know it's Chad but it's not Chad, yeah, but it, Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. He is a, an aggregate. He went into an aggregate of one of the three heroes that I generally use. And he's aggregated into one of the main ones, actually. You'll get aggregated in now, too, because I like you. <laughs> no, it's the storyteller's mind. And I didn't know I was a storyteller until a few years ago. I started writing a fiction book. And it took on a life of its own that became so huge um, and so powerful that it has actually nearly crippled me. And um, has gotten some attention from some people who think that it's going to get published. I don't believe it, but they do. Anyway, it's, it's finished. It's a draft. It's a 400-page book. <laughs> Well, and we all look forward to reading it. I, I'd kind of, I don't want to end there because I don't want this to end, but I feel like maybe, maybe one last thing we could talk about because it's more of a general thing before we do a little bit of Q&A and then we'll let you go and then we'll schedule a part two awesome. is um, your encounter with Sylvia Massey. Because we talked oh, yeah. a little bit about like seeing Susan and, you know, Jackie just came up for a second. But obviously when you run into other women doing this, it's kind of a big deal just because they exist. But I think, well, go on. Sylvia was a particularly big deal because not only does she exist, she existed during the time when almost no others did. I think there might've been um, uh, Susan, Susan Rogers, Peggy Leonard, Sylvia Massey, Leslie Ann Jones, and um, there's another really, um, Le uh, Unger. Le uh, oh, uh, Leanne? Not no. Leanne. Um, yeah, Leanne Unger, right? I think so, yeah. And Maureen Droney was probably still working for a bit. but Right, then, I mean, so, but they, yeah. were, they, were, they were out there, but I mean, they never crossed my path until Susan did that one time. And then Sylvia Massey, and I'm working on her Neve board, right? Because that was during Queens of the Stone Age that I ran into Sylvia Massey. And, uh, you know, I was, I don't know, in my thirties. Anyway, I met her and we were talking uh, in the kitchen. And of course, again, I was just in awe of the fact that she owned consoles. I just thought that was uh, indescribably cool. But her words to me were, if you want a family, a child, a husband, you have to actually leave this business period. It will never happen just like Susan told me, you'll never become an engineer in this town. She said, you will never have a family unless you actually are not in this business for a long enough time to procure that. And then you can come back, maybe, probably not. But you cannot have both. It will never happen. Um, and she went on to tell me that her, I believe she married her husband when she was on a hiatus mm. from, uh, from working. And I took her very seriously. And not long after that, I cut a something for Kate record again in Australia. I was in Australia for 40 days and 40 nights, just like Moses in the desert. 
Neda Ulabi from NPR actually interviewed me during that record in Australia on the radio about women in the studio. And I told her on the air that this would be my last record, that Something for Kate record, that I was going to quit, that I was canceling all my other work, which I did. And when I flew back to Los Angeles, um, I stayed at the Beverly Laurel, we mastered the record, Something for Kate and I, and then I would finally go back to New Orleans. I hadn't been home in a long time. I had effectively just quit my job. I had signed up to be an archeologist, not paid, like you paid for your own flight, but you could be a volunteer on archeological digs as long as you paid for your own um, travel. Right. And you would just be an assistant. And I was signed up for actually two of those. Um, and I flew home, um, interestingly, standing out in front of the Beverly Laurel, waiting for a cab to take me to LAX, jet lagged still from you know being in Australia for a long time. And this guy came up to me and he was like Sufi or something. And he had a, a turban and, and one of the forehead dots. So I don't know what religion that signifies or what ethnic religious group, but um, he came up to me and he, he asked me if he could tell me, and I'm not a spiritual, like I'm not that kind of spiritual person. I'm more scientific, um, but I believe in everything actually. Um, but he said, I want to tell you something. And I thought he wanted money and I was burned out. And I was like, what? And he said, uh, you will live to be more than 90. And the best thing that will ever happen in your life is right in front of you, but you cannot see it. And then he walked away. And I was like, dude, that was weird. That <laughs> what was fucking a dick. so weird. What a dick. <laughs> you know, I was like, did you even want $5? So get on the plane, fly home, jet lag, can't sleep. Ask my friend, Mike um, Napol Napolitano. You know, oh, let's meet for a drink. Okay, yeah, because I can't sleep. Meet me at El Matador. Okay, yeah, and I show up there with my dog. And there's this dude playing and he's just on, by himself on stage. And he's got a cool Falcon amp and he's got cool boots and he's cute. And I was like, fuck musicians. I'm so done with it. I'm meeting a professor of archeology. span I'm gonna do a Sylvia said and leave the business and go find a husband or at least a, a partner. And I want a baby. And I'm gonna have, I'm not gonna turn 40 alone in the control in a, in a hotel with a bunch of CDs. Um, my career's really going nowhere. So what, I mean, kind of a producer, but I'm never really gonna make the big time. I don't even wanna make the big time. I don't even know what it is. I hate the people who did, they're all mean. And so I'm gonna be an archeologist. And, uh, and, then I, and then I shot some tequila and then I put a note on the stage for that musician. And I said, if you're single and live in Louisiana, you should call me. And I left and he called me. And six months later, I was pregnant accidentally and then i had a baby and then me and him are still together and i didn't have to quit all of my career i only had to say in my heart i'm leaving this i'm done i'm finished i'm going to cancel records to prove that i'm done i'm going to tell nada ulubi on npr that i'm done i'm going to upset the guy who was kind of like my manager but he didn't really do anything and so that he's yelling at me and then I'm gonna go back to New Orleans and I'm gonna go on my archeological digs. And that very net night, I met my husband. And then I had my baby within a year. Wow. So the dude out front of the Beverly Laurel was not fucking around. No. He could see that. And then I went right back to work. <laughs> Cause I need money. <laughs> and I don't know how to do anything else. That was Sylvia Massey, I think pointed me mystically to the Suf to Australia, then to the Sufi, and then through her, all of it happened because of what she said and how I acted on it. And I think, I mean, obviously it's really specific being a woman in the industry and what she was talking about. But I think it's also, you can generalize it a little bit to everybody's got more than one goal in their life. They have things they want to have happen and they all have to happen in parallel. But you can't just fuck around with all of them at the same time and hope they're all just going to magically happen. You got to concentrate on each one in its time and achieve yes. it. And sometimes it's going to be one at the expense of the other. Sometimes it won't. Or, But that's really important. And it's really, really smart to just say, let's make it definite and then see how yeah. that works out. Right. And, 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 and have the, you know, the knowledge, you know, already having thought I quit my career once and then already seeing also great fame and, and big records come by and not leave me in their wake, but leave me in their wake. Um, I was in the wake of the big thing that was happening. I was tumbling in the wingtip, wingtip vortices of other people's massive success and it was battering me. 
And it was actually battering my stories and my creativity. It was making me not able to be creative. And I recognized that my genius will never be in the big game thing. It'll be in these little crevices of beauty that I can craft without interference. And it has proved to be true. I, absolutely. Well, look, let's stop there because that leaves us a lot of stuff for part two. And let's have a little bit of a Q&A where I would imagine someone's going to ask you about low end or compressors because that's what it is. <laughs> because that's what they do. That's how they do yeah, it. Yeah. And, you know, those I are all, answer them. those are all fair questions, I suppose. But that's why I don't talk about them because I know someone else will. So, hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. Hello. How are Hi. you doing? Amazing. This has been awesome. And I love that People we went over three hours and... and we're not even close to there and that you're willing to come back. So this is excellent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> excellent. Yeah, everybody got happy when you guys mentioned a part two. So, uh, oh, good. You are also, uh, I'm pretty sure it's official that you are uh, named the biggest badass on the show. <laughs> Who? Andrew or me? <laughs> no, not me. You. <laughs> <laughs> By whom? By you? Yeah. By you, Mark? No, no by, by well, the yes, chat. He's yes, interacting with people. I'm talking, look, <laughs> oh. I'm sitting here showing people a toothpick when you go away. Like, I got nothing. It's well, all you. Well, whoever voted me the, 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 the supreme badass, then I vote them back the supreme badass. They're equal. All right. All right. There you go, guys. Well, let's do, <laughs> do a few awesome. questions. Because you got, what, like all 15 right. minutes left? Yeah, I, I think near 5, 5, 10, I'm going to have to go because I have to get my kid to Yamani by 6. Okay, so you eat. answer as many as you want as quickly as you want and then say, got I got to go. All right. That's how we we'll play it. it. Cool. All right. All right. All right. First question comes from Adrian. Adrian says, big fan of Big Night Oil. What was it like working with that band, the vibe, et cetera? Uh, the vibe was amazing. Um, the... Uh, Peter Garrett is the lead singer, right? Or am I an idiot? No, that's got to be right. I think you're um, right. We'll say you're right. Well for, well, for one thing, he is exceptionally tall. And I don't mean like a tall-ish guy. I mean a skyscraper no, of a man. he's huge. Yeah, I think he might be <laughs> seven feet tall. So not only is he massive and beautiful, um, right away that just puts you in a space of awe because he because he had this beautiful personality to go with it. Um, it was a blast. He was a pro, he was genius, everybody was. I had a lot of fun on that record. They were very specific to what they wanted. You know, stretching a microphone up where you have to go like, all right, I think that's tall enough because that's as tall as I can reach and then have that not be tall enough. But you don't remember the most about that record? And I still do this. Peter's only exercise, he told me, now maybe he's lying, is to get into, I'll try to show you on the thing here, get into like a squat position. My legs are in a squat right now, right? And you pretend like you're holding a ball like this. Okay, wait, I'll back up and I'll really show you people because it was a game changer. Like this, squat, hold a ball, stand there for 20 minutes, try it. It's I, impossible. My quads would catch on fire. I couldn't do yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> well, he could. So he would be in that position, sweating profusely, like running off of him, but holding conversations. So you'd walk by and be like, hey, Peter, so that next song, um, did you want blah, blah, blah? And he'd be holding the ball and sweating and not moving. You know, no love, just, you know, and, and responding to you. And so to me, then he became like a Greek god so that he, he, he moved from just being a really tall, cool Australian to being actually a titan, like a god. And that's my clearest feeling of, of that whole record is that that dude ended up in, in my pantheon ascending to um, godhood. Wow, and he's probably still tall as shit even when he's squatting. Yeah, well that's just it. You know, he's right at your eye level, yet he's squatting, he's like this massive alabaster god because his skin was like really white and his head was shaped. So he just seemed like, like, like truly, I thought, you know, he's like a God, obviously, you know, so you just <laughs> add him in right now. Um, gracious, brilliantly talented, the whole band, it was a blast. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Well, uh, while you were talking about um, uh, potentially quitting, uh, Mike Paragon says that <laughs> Tina is the reason why I quit trying to make records for a living. <laughs> Mike is my friend. Hello, Mike. Um, 
Well, Mike, no, Mike and I had some good times in uh, East Iris Studio. It became known as House of Blues, but it was East Iris when I started there. I mixed there a lot um, before and after Katrina. And uh, Mike managed, and he also is a fine engineer, but he was also, uh, you know what it is about Mike? Mike was the dude before any of us had all, all had like new cell phones, certainly not iPhones. Um, you know, I still had like a Nokia flip phone. Mike always rolled in with the brand new thing that Apple had, whatever it was, the new iPhone, the iPod. Mike had his first. I'm like, what is that? Oh, I don't want one of those. That looks scary. I always had the brand new Mac. So he was on the edge of the computer world that I was still pushing back on Pro Tools, all of it. And without him, I would have never really been able to navigate digital recording like I do now. So he taught me everything that I would, it was necessary for me to survive in my life today as I am right now. I love you, brother. I would say he's the paragon of something. Yes, he is. He's the paragon of the Paragoni. There you go. Awesome. I, so I couldn't think of anything either. <laughs> but I just didn't finish. Well, the he said uh, he said hi, and uh, he wanted to start a family. That was the reason. Um, yes. But he also has a question that's really good. So Mike's question is uh, on this topic of imagination and fantasy that you developed to build the song. What if you hate the artist and song, and you're not happy when you're working on the project? Well, then usually the fantasy would consist of a murder scene <laughs> where my hero and heroine are faced with some you know, very bad serial killer. Um, something terrible is about to happen. They are going to get into an awful accident of some kind. And then the music would just be this droll, hated backdrop of this really passionate yet disturbing scene. And neither one of them really love the song, yet the song still has power. It has power to move the scene forward. So those songs too have to be given really great mixes and really great treatments because they're still powering a scene, even though it's a negative power that they're uh, sending into my imagination. All right. Good answer. All right. Awesome. Uh, okay. Next up is from Sam Sergi and Sam says, Hey, Trina, can you talk about the drum sound on maybe angels by Cheryl Crow? So inspiring for me. Um, well, I can in that it was, uh, Brian McLeod on drums. I believe it was a, um, probably a Ludwig kit. You know, I'm not really sure that Brian would remember. Maybe there were only four microphones. There was kick, snare, hat, and a single overhead. I bust them all down to, no, there were a few more. I think I had a Tom mic and I may have had one more cymbal mic. Yet they were bust down to uh, kick and snare on one track and then everything else on another track. And then the very beginning, the Now remember we were running loops too. So I had also looped that kit through the uh, harmonizer H3000. So it then printed the loop. But in order to get that feedback, I had to do it like 35 times until finally that was feeding the uh, 11, 11.76s back on themselves uh, together, like, but you had to do it, it just got lucky. And I got one of them where I got into record on time and I fed the entrance of the drum loop back on itself, started the song, brought them back really quick so that they were no longer feeding back. And that's exactly what you're hearing. It was completely organic, but I did have to attempt it at least more than a dozen, probably two dozen times by myself in the studio. So I made that sound all by myself. Nobody was helping me. And that was like yeah. your idea to do it. You're like, man, this yes. would be fucking awesome. Yes, because I had done something like that before accidentally created a beginning of a feedback problem with an 1176 and then recognized what I had done. And real. And so I had, I had practiced that move on somebody else's record, but never really achieved it like I did that singular time at the front of Maybe Angels. And I've never been able to do it again. Wow. I've had versions of it, but never as cool and perfect as that. Awesome. Otherwise, it was a standard recording. I di didn't hew the drum mics or anything. I just bust them all together and moved on. Awesome. OK, uh, next question. This one goes to both of you. This is from Darren. 
oh God. and uh, sort of a state of affairs. Um, <laughs> so would you say it's worth it opening a studio facility at all with how good at home studio equipment has become? I'm looking to open a studio in Worcestershire, uh, offering a bit of classic old school gear from vintage effects, keyboards, and awesome Bradshaw guitar effects rig, or should I really not bother? I'll answer that. What kind of console are you planning on putting in there? I mean, I guess yeah. I'm answering that with a question. Yeah. yeah. Because it all comes down to the board. I mean, you could open up a cool facility with some great, you know, gear and have beautiful sounding rooms and wonderful instruments and people love, sh I personally love showing up at a proper studio to do work. Um, as long as you have a great headphone system and I mean, killer headphone system, um, you know, that's pretty, that's, a, that would be an expectation of mine. If I want to sit around at home, you know, I don't want to go to a studio and listen to shitty headphones. That's for sure. But really, unless you're going to put a console in there, I'm not sure it's worth it. And you're going to need to put a good console. And I mean like a Neve or an API, something for real. Cause that's what somebody like, I wouldn't come there if I didn't have access to a great board. Otherwise I will just stay home. Would you be all right with a, a collection of good like racked up modules and pre's so if you had some neves and some apis and that yeah. and then yeah yes i would be if the monitors were fantastic yeah. if the control room was a proper control room that had great monitoring i would forsake a console i mean i work without one um i would prefer to have one but if not as long as the gear was as if i had a console and the monitoring was as if it was above of a console you know like yeah. And and really great monitors because if the room doesn't sound good then again I'd rather just stay home where it does sound great. Yeah, and you can't overstate the headphone system. No. It's it's the most important part of a session unless no one's wearing headphones. Right. So without great sounding cans the whole thing's a nightmare. Yeah. So invest in your headphones, you invest in little? your Huh? Well, uh, just uh, just on that, what would you guys um, consider to be like a really great system? The, the two systems I've worked on, uh, the Furman ones that they don't make anymore, the ones with the 50-pin yeah. connectors on the back of the headphone boxes, those sound really, really good. Uh, Q8s? Yeah, yeah, those are great. You can also just like go get some Mackie 1202s. Like yeah. they're fine. They, they sound good and just run it, make it yourself. But I think at this point, People are used to mixing their own headphones and you can always go help someone out. So it's fine to have the mix your own stations and there are a lot of different ways to do it. But yeah, the hear back stuff, anything that's trying to transmit a bunch of analog audio over an ethernet cable, it's going to sound like ass and there's no yeah. gain. There's no punch. And it's, it's your really headphone difficult. cables mm -hmm. connected in the headphone boxes should be this thick around with big E deck conductors or whatever, you know, the, they should be big, chunky analog headphone things. There are some decent digital ones, but shoot. I mean, if you're going to build a studio, spend the $20,000 you need to spend and buy a smoking hot old system or build one out of Mackie's um, and make it real. And Furman's, yeah, you get Furman's if you find them a lot cheaper than that. I mean, I had yeah. two of the brains and like seven headphone boxes and maybe I spent, 3500 bucks on them or something right. they're around and then and then also be sure that not only do you have the um the hardware for the headphone stations but how are you planning on sending signal to these what's your plan like what's your routing if you're yeah. on a console you know you have a lot of different ways that you can feed the cans um how are you going to feed the cans consistent loud great sounding cans and the fact is people will come to your studio if you got great cans and I think you got to, if you're opening a facility, it has to be focused on the things that people wouldn't have at home. Because yes, home studios can be amazing with almost nothing, but most of them don't have the ability to record a band at the same time, whether that's with isolation or not. That's a, a choice for the, the band to make, not for you to make necessarily. But And it doesn't have to be crazy and over the top. There's a fantastic studio. Um, he's talking about in Worcestershire, I'm assuming in the UK. I don't know that for sure. And that's, I live in Worcestershire. So I know of um, a great studio called Vale Studios, which is down near Pershore. And it's got, he's got a Neve. Um, it's a BCM 20, I believe, something like that. But that's not really the point. The point is that his live rooms, which he's built himself, sound great and the headphones are great. And he's got enough microphones and knows how to set it up. Because you, 
you're not building a traditional large studio. So when a band comes in, they're going to look to you to say, well, okay, so how do we do this logistically? And you want to go, man, drums are fucking awesome over there. If you want to isolate, you can put the bass amp in there and let you get them up and going. Then, yes, there's always going to be a call for it. And if you can manage to do it where you can price it, where bands that can't afford the few studios that are left that are really expensive, then there's probably a market for it. But it's precarious, I would say. Yeah. And the other thing is, in England, if you are not near a town and there isn't a pub down the road people can stay at, you have got to be residential. You're totally fucking yourself if you're not. Because people can't commute from two and a half hours away. Mm -mm. So, and they're going to drink when they're working, almost certainly, and they can't be drinking yeah. and driving. So that you either need to have a place for them to stay there or just cut a deal with a couple of local pubs and the cab service, and then you're golden. I agree. Agreed. Agreed. Moving on. Okay. Build your studio. I'm Thank coming. You next. All right. How are you on time? Uh, I'm good. Let's go for another 10 minutes. Okay, cool. Uh, so next question. Hey, Trina, thanks for taking the time to be here. Out of all the artists you've worked with, which one do you feel has the most talent and musicianship and why? Also, what was the rate you charged when you went first independent? Uh, feel free to skip anything. Uh, thank you, Trina, Fab, and Andrew for this priceless information and education. Um, well, my, um, you know, again, uh, my, when I first went independent, uh, that would have been, I guess, officially the, you know, after the Emmy record, I think I was maybe getting uh, about 120 bucks a day. You're not going to survive on it. Um, I should have been getting more then too, but that's what I was getting paid. So yeah, I made about $500 a week, um, which, which worked okay for me then. And my favorite artist that I ever recorded, is that what they're asking me? Mm -hmm. Or just mm -hmm. my favorite artist? No, I think I think that, uh, you, that worked you worked with. with me. Who was the most? But talented? you can answer any question that you think. Yeah, you were because asked. that that doesn't that I can't answer that. I mean, you know, I can't say, well, you know, Emmy was better than well, Lisa Germano. For I mean, in other words, it was all about the songs. I didn't really care about the artists. All right, look for the ones you worked with. It's obvious. It's Shakira. So move on. Who's your favorite? Right. <laughs> I want to kick to sound like the Queen. You know, like the one you do in Nirvana. <laughs> and I was like, um, Shakira, I didn't record Queen or Nirvana. No, 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 the Queen that you do. And I'm like, Queen's of the Stone Age? Yes, this Queen. I want my kick drum. This is how I want it. Do you know that I'm married to a prince? And I was like, you're married to a prince? Oh, this <laughs> happened. And she's like, no, a prince, a prince of Nicaragua. He will be here soon. And I was like, cool. Um, back to the kick drum, though. Like, <laughs> the, the Queen's of the Stone Age kick drum. We can't get that one here. We can't get that sound here. We're not, we're not even on analog tape so whatever it was so funny she was very cute they fired me <laughs> that's amazing she's very driven though she's she's oh yeah 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 i was pregnant then though so i didn't i couldn't work in on that record okay so you want to just name an artist that you love whatever i mean there obviously there is a playlist as well which i'm sure has been posted already um I cannot answer. There is not. I mean, if I'm going to name my favorite artist, I've already talked about those, and I never recorded them. Everybody else that I've ever recorded. Here, I, I'll um, get, I'm going to give are, you. I'm going to give you. They a are my ball. favorite. I'm going to give Every you an underhand. Them. No, no, no. I'm giving you an underhand one now. Your husband's pretty good, huh? Yeah, Grayson Caps, my <laughs> husband, who is fantastic, and I have been with for 18 years. Um, I made a record for him, actually. A. Uh, 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 um, retrospective called South Front Street. You should go buy it. It's amazing. Uh, it tells the story of my life in songs. And I love his music. I love him. But no, he's not the most talented person I've ever recorded or the most. No, he's the, you know, he's who I have sex with, you know. Um, <laughs> I recorded Joe Cocker singing. You know, in other words, there's no Yeah, Joe way. Cocker is like the next line we get to when we come back for part two. We're starting yeah, I mean, there, there's no, I, I recorded Neil Young at one point. You know, in other words, there's just too many. And then there's people you'd have never heard of that were badasses beyond belief. So yeah. it, it's unanswerable. Unanswerable. Moving on. Yeah. Well, going back to your husband, um, was Grace and Cap's Scarlet Roses recorded to tape? This album sounds amazing. The records you've worked on sound always sound so live and does it naturally go there or is it a conscious process? Um, it is, uh, 
it naturally goes again where it is going to go. If they all sound kind of live, it's because that is what music is to me is, is, a, is, a, is a capturing of the moment. Grayson's uh, Scarlet Roses, we did not hit tape, we did not hit analog tape with it, but I want to qualify that by saying just because the end recorder is not analog tape and the end recorder is digital, it still went through analog microphones into beautiful old class A discrete analog preamps through an analog board, through analog compressors out into the, into the digital tape machine, back out of the digital tape machine through an analog console, back through more analog gear, and ultimately is every bit an analog record with the exception of the fact that we did not hit tape because we couldn't afford it. All right. Awesome. There you go. Okay, uh, let's see. So uh, next question is for Andrew from Darren. Uh, well, Andrew, we were you aware of Cheryl? For me. Okay. So well, on. it's somewhat related. All right. Come were on, you aware on. of Cheryl from your MJ days uh, when you were as Keats Tech? Uh, well, yes. As because as I mentioned, she was background singer on the Bad Tour. I did the Dangerous Tour, which was the tour afterwards. But uh, obviously, a lot of people were still there from the Bad Tour. So I heard lots about her. And Scooter, I'm pretty sure it's the same Scooter was the Pepsi rep on the uh, Michael Jackson tour. I and that's where he correct. had met he had met yeah. Cheryl on that tour and then left that corporate gig to manage her. I think that you're absolutely right on that. Yeah. I corroborate. He he set up the gigantic inflatable Pepsi can at every gig. <laughs> good on you, Scooter. Yeah, man. I, look, good on him. <laughs> Holy shit is all I got to say about that. So, uh, yes, but absolutely aware. And, you know, everybody there would talked about how driven she was and that she was going to do what she was going to do. Awesome. And she did. And she did. All right. Well, uh, let's do one more and then we can get Yeah, no more questions for me, though, because that's ridiculous. <laughs> Unless it's about awesome. the toothpick okay. or my cats. Guys, hit the hit the questions quick. <laughs> okay, uh, Rich Clay uh, asks. Well, he says uh, it's impressive uh, the idea of scoring a mix to an internal vision. Uh, has any artist ever had the desire to make one of your visions into a video? No, because I have never once shared any of my visions with any artist, and I never will. But. Mm. They're in my book. <laughs> no, my, my book doesn't use any real songs. Um, it's utterly, completely fiction. The act of what I'm doing is 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 uh, is manifested in there. But no, I never share them with the artist. I never have, and I, I likely never will. They're 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 very personal. Um, so no, I've I've never I've, I would be too embarrassed. The fact that I've even told you guys this is only because I may be faced with publishing this book and then it's all all the truth of the Trina Shoemaker is about to come it's not about me but there will be things about me that the the people will now know that they've never known my I secret think life I gotta say I, I think it's awesome I've never heard of anything like it and it's absolutely fascinating to me but I mean look mm -hmm. we all get really invested in the projects we work on while we're working on them and it manifests in different ways and mine are always much more vague and you know they might go as far as like I really want people to feel like they might cry when we get to this part of the song like but that's it I don't actually get the story of it and I'm not a lyric person either so I'm not really following the lyrics of the song necessarily but the sounds of words can trigger stuff but I love the idea of that this song is soundtracking something. Yes, and for me, it's not something that I'm doing on purpose. I have, I've been told, you know, a little bit throughout my life that I might be a little bit on the spectrum, whatever. Like, it's like almost like an autistic thing. It's almost like an obsessive compulsion. And, and I've done it since I was a child. It's just that music ended up being this really perfect vehicle to carry out my fantasies with and then it became you know the only th the thing that i did um you know realize the internal fantasies upon well let me ask you two little questions to finish up then so one of them to do with that is do you come up with these scenarios for every album you listen to that you like or is it just when you're working 
Um, it's, mm. it's, it's more often when I'm working because I have so much time in the song. Right. I mean, there are hours and hours and hours invested. That's a lot of fantasy time. But that is not to say that I don't have active fantasies for at least a hundred full length albums. And they that don't been... and they don't change once they're set. They're kind no, of like that. They pretty it. much stay. I okay. might update them sometimes if I get like some kind of new information. Like something changes radically that I have to go and update the one that I have for Stay With Me that I've had probably since I was, you know, I've been fan I had a fantasy about that song since I was a, a kid. But the studio version of that fantasy took place after I knew what it what what recording was and then I could update that fantasy with new behavior from my from my characters <laughs> that reflected more of my knowledge you know it's right. hard to it's really hard to explain no, it's I, a mental I illness I fucking love it it's amazing so my other question goes back to you talking about this idea of sort of discovering sound constantly and like not incrementally moving forward i mean you said exponentially does this make it hard for you to go back and listen to stuff you've done previously? Or is that not a problem for you? Not a problem because that person who did that knew everything that you could possibly know about sound in that moment. And then that moment is, is, is um, captured. So it reflects a point in time and a point in, 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 in saturation that I'm really proud of. It almost feels like it almost feels exalting and lifted like, oh God, it's so free now because you know, it, it already happened. I, it, it's not required to carry me forward anymore. It, it carried me as far as it could and there it is. You know, there's a song on a, a Blues Traveler song called Pretty Angry that's off the Blues Traveler record I get. And I go back and listen to that and man, I was a novice, I think, but not really because that thing captured the best of what I could possibly have delivered sonically in that moment. And it could never be better, not today and not before it happened. So they're the little vehicles of these stories. And once they're set, you know, they, they, they shine with youth and, and, and abandon and freedom. So no, I would never be ashamed of them. I'm thrilled by them. That is awesome. I love how mm -hmm. generous you are with yourself through all of this. And that's, yeah, that's really difficult to do. And so anyway, we should leave that there because I am in awe. So well, we're going to do it again. And I got are. my stuff set up just right. I'll know just how it was. It'll look the same. Yeah. I'll do my hair different, though. No, no, no. You we do need, yours we, different. I need, <laughs> I need continuity. We got to. Fine. Get, no, no, we don't. So look, just before you or you can go if you got to run. But I need to clear up some scheduling stuff with people because people are getting confused because normally I only ever say who's on next week. But I started talking about something that's coming up and then everyone got really confused. So look, next week is Phil Brown. So if you've ever heard, so. ever heard the Talk Talk records, you know what I'm talking about. And that's going to be amazing. Um, and then the following week is something I'm really looking forward to is Ed Stasium. That's going to be just fucking nuts, I'm sure. But the week after that, which is March 15th, and people are getting very confused, March 15th is the hearing panel. So that's with Chad and Susan Rogers and Bella Bathurst all about the fact that none of us have perfect hearing and that's okay. That's kind of the main point of the panel. But there'll be Susan knows more about how you hear and what you hear than basically anyone I've ever talked to. I've got some theories that I'll spew nonsense about. Um, and also I'm gonna talk to the rest of them and make sure they're cool with it, but I was gonna start with like a very quick explanation of what your actual physical auditory system is and does and then what the neurological part of hearing does and how they're different and just to kind of set the mood but that is march 15th not before and not after so those are our next three weeks and that's all i'm gonna be to here for all that. of them well and you got about 900 hours to catch up on from youtube too. Oh. <laughs> you got the previous 40. I can't wait for you to uh for you to talk about talk talk on Andrew Talks to Awesome People. <laughs> it's gonna be it's <laughs> gonna be good. And Phil, I mean, obviously we're gonna get into it and Phil will probably say a lot of what's in his book, but he's got a book, I believe it's called Are We Still Rolling? Something like mm -hmm. that. And it's fucking good. It's really good. And one of my favorite things about it is he said, and he says it in the book, is that the way he wrote the book was he knew what each chapter was going to be and he just sat 
with those records playing over and over and over while he wrote the chapters to have everything come back to him. But you talk about being invested in a record. I don't think there's anything I've ever heard like his description of those Talk Talk records. It's insane. So I'm really looking forward to that. It's going to be great. And he's a really cool guy. And he's done a bunch of other shit too, like, you know, Hendrix, whatever. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Some bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Trina, thank you so much. This is welcome. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Love and it. I'll get with you to schedule part two. We're actually booked up into May now, but we'll pick a date. No problem. And awesome. We'll do it. And I'm really glad this finally got to happen because this is our third try. I know. Thank you for your patience. That was a hard fall for me, but I, I got man, through it. And you've survived right. it. Yes, Mark. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for Great being to meet here. You. All right. All right. See you guys. So this is the awkward right. mute the mic and go to the thanks for watching. Okay, here we go. Muting. <laughs> Did it. Done. <laughs> Gone. Nice. <laughs> and gone. <laughs> oh, we're not even muted, though. Everyone can stop.